right, episode 23 of our podcast. Wow. God. This is the Michael Jordan episode, <laughs> number 23. Well, we are here in Panama. It is our 48th country. We are getting ready to ship to Colombia in a little over two weeks, roughly. Yeah. First time shipping for a couple of years now. We shipped back just about two years ago from Europe. And since then, we've gone through all of Central America, and we are now at the town of El Valle de Anton, which is about an hour and a half west of Panama City. So Panama City is where we need to be to start prepping all the stuff. We're staying at kind of a restaurant slash hotel. They have a yard, we can park our van over there. The real reason we're here is because it's higher in elevation and it's so hot. In Central America, we're just yeah. doing anything we can to avoid the heat. <laughs> yeah, so we've been kind of going from one high elevation place to another. This one's not quite as high. This is 2,000 feet compared to where we were before. Last week, we were in Boquete, which is all the way near the border of Costa Rica. It's about an hour north of the main highway. So we're escaping the heat. We're trying to burn some time before we have to go down in elevation to do all the stuff. And it's Semana Santa, so it's like the busiest weekend yeah. of the entire year, I think. And so we're just absorbing and hanging out and all, like all the activities they have in town. We were actually very concerned. There's some side-by-sides <laughs> -side driving by right now, blasting music. <laughs> we'll come to the podcast. Oh, maybe we need to re-record <laughs> this. No, it's all right. This is real life, bro. <laughs> okay. Here in the El Valle de Anton, we're here for a couple more days. But we wanted to bring you guys another episode of our podcast. Our last one was all about cats, traveling with cats. So this one is an interview. This yeah. is an interview that we recorded when we were still in Costa Rica a few weeks ago. We interviewed, we talked to Alexandria from She Roams Wild. She's somebody who is only a few years out of college and started traveling and sharing her story on YouTube. And we're very intrigued. She travels with a dog. She has been in three different campers. A self-built van. Transit. I think so. I want to say it's a Ford Transit van. Mm -hmm. And then she was in a school bus, like a shorty school bus for a little bit. And then now she is in a Bigfoot fiberglass truck camper in the back of a Toyota Tundra. So very interesting story, very cool story. It was great to talk to her. We talked to her when she was in Baja. She had just arrived in the Los Barriles area of Southern Baja. We chatted with her a lot about our time in Baja and we gave her some places to go, things to see. But since then, she has actually left Baja early. Hmm. We were wondering, you know, if she was going to stay for a while. At the time, she seemed like she was going to keep traveling. But I think, you know, she just didn't feel it after her first few weeks there, when she, especially when she got down to the Southern part. I think maybe there were a lot of people it was and getting was, hotter, I think. It was getting warm. Yeah. yeah, and she was traveling alone. So there's a lot of considerations to kind of think about when you're a, especially a solo female traveler. So we talked to her a little bit about that. So we want to share this interview with you guys. It was a couple hours long. So for those of you that follow her on YouTube, she shares, I think, a video a week. And you might find this kind of behind the scenes of her story interesting. So we'll just get right into it. Hope you guys enjoy. I am currently, I think it's Punta Pescado, just north of uh, Los Barriles. Did you drive down that yeah. dirt road? So I unfortunately had to get to Los Barriles from La Ventana a little bit faster. So now I'm working my way north on it um, instead of going oh, you are. southbound. Yeah. Are you going further south from there? I thought you were going to the East Cape, aren't you? I will be, yeah. I still wanted okay. to see if I could hit this section so it, it doesn't make sense uh, in terms of fuel economy, but I still am yeah. enjoying the climb. <laughs> I will say It's a little bit of a rugged road. It's worth driving if you were going there anyways. I don't know if you want to like double back just to do it. <laughs> okay. Because there's not a lot of stuff that you can like, you can't really pull over and spend a night anywhere because it's it's pretty narrow mm -hmm. and it's it's just a good alternative for somebody who wants to be a little adventurous to go that way i don't think you necessarily want to do it's not like 
I wouldn't say it's a must see, but you know, a lot of people we know are always looking for something different. So we're like, okay, this is something different. You can try it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this beach, a lot of folks that I know are still further south down on the East Cape or Cerritos and yeah. even in Los Barillas. And I had stopped at a couple points because it was getting late in the day. I was like, maybe I'll just make the jump tomorrow. But I mean, this beach has been spectacular, jumping rays and dolphins, uh, great oh, yeah. snorkeling and no one around. So I'm really yeah. enjoying the solitude of this like southernmost portion at least. So we'll see. Yeah, we were, we, we pulled over on on our way to Los Perilas and just had to take pictures of jumping rays. Yeah, and I think so that's many. probably where they are the most active, it feels like. Yeah, I had a huge show this morning, probably 20 or so, just going across oh, the horizon cool. close to the sunrise, and it was it was awesome. Oh, man. You should fly the drone next time you see it. <laughs> I know. You... I've been a little hesitant about that. I've heard and read a bit that you're not supposed to down here without your license, and not well, that I'm yeah. you know, always a Google follower. I know everyone else is doing it, but, but yeah, I haven't busted it out yet. Depends on the drone you have, and depends on, like, you know what rule you abide by like we've yeah. we've talked to some people who like contacted government officials in Mexico about the rules and they somebody did say that a sub 250 gram drone is fair game so oh well that's what i have so okay yeah. maybe i'll have so to you might be yeah. okay <laughs> yeah i mean then, I the, then there's other people who are like no i'm not doing it i'm not going to be one of those gringos that break the rules like, okay well <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i think if it's going to be for like a big commercial shoot that's probably right one end of the spectrum but if it's just to get a better look at the rays i might maybe i'll bend the rules <laughs> the, the rule they instituted is pretty it's pretty draconian it's like basically no non-mexican nationals can fly at all yeah. which yeah. is you know I mean, every time I see somebody fly, I'm like, well, technically that's not legal, but it's kind of one of those things where they have the rule in place and they'll enforce it. If they see a problem, they want to be able to enforce it, but, you know, it's pretty lax. But e even if nothing else, like when you see like 20 rays out there like jumping, that means there's like hundreds, if not thousands, that you can see just below the surface. Oh. I have a friend who, in this area, or maybe a little further south, last week, brought her drone out and was shooting, and she ended up actually yeah. going out and swimming, and then had her friend man the drone, and it was such an epic, wow. epic shot. <laughs> yeah. This wind is crazy today, of course, too. Oh, I mean, you're in, like, you're in, like, kiteboarding zone right there. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's been crazy though, since getting in, I was in La Ventana probably five or six days ago. We've had two to three mile an hour winds every day. It has been yeah. hot, and super, super low winds. So this, it's a nice breeze. It's a nice change in uh, temperature, but it's been really pleasant actually as a non, you know, kite surfer. I'm sure the people <laughs> who are there are pissed. <laughs> probably. <laughs> like what the hell is yeah. this? <laughs> No, I'm sure. I, maybe I'll take a lesson or something if they pick up, but I'm more of a traditional surfer, so. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I, I don't know if all that gear is for me. And it's a lot of gear. And it seems I like... I have enough, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you're so tired from being on the water all day, and then you have to, like, break all that stuff down, pack it all away, clean it up. Yeah. Oh, I'm just not into it. I think it's, like, I think it's a good transition from, like, wakeboarding water skiing maybe because you know people that love that kind of water sports like really into the constant action yeah. whereas like surfing is more like paddling out sitting on your board waiting for waves or just as much of surfing if not i mean for most of us it's the majority of surfing yeah my dad and i used to joke because I, I grew up in santa cruz which is a big surfing area off of the northern and central coast of california and my dad and i joked that we don't surf we paddle that's the sport the surfing <laughs> is like percent of right. the time right, right. but most oh. of it's sitting waiting and getting pounded by the waves on the way out <laughs> i mean two percent two percent is a lot you know <laughs> i mean probably must this. be good <laughs> that means you're out there for an hour and like surfing for uh what is that in an hour like a minute and a half or something i mean that's fair fair <laughs> but yeah. that's cool so yeah, so you grew up in santa cruz 
I did, yeah, Santa Cruz Mountains, so not in town, but just uh, right up the hill. It's like a 20-minute okay. drive down to the beach. Yeah, that's cool. a pretty area. Yeah, like Scotts Valley area? Yeah, right around there, actually, um, off of Summit, cool. if you know the area at all. Um, the ridge line that comes down where the Loma Prieta earthquake happened, some people would know that Yeah, well. right. Um, that's where I grew up, long after the earthquake, thankfully, but really, really yeah, beautiful area. Yeah, the earthquake was like uh early 90s right 89 yeah 89 okay yeah because yeah, i i had just moved to california in 88 80 oh, well. 88 89 no yeah. 87 <laughs> i don't know it's you Dan. 87 i think maybe <laughs> yeah and i remember that i remember that really well like because my my uncle was living in san jose okay yeah uh, my brother Crazy. actually lives in uh, Los Gatos now, so he's not far from where you're from. I went to so Los we're Gatos actually in Small World. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really funny. Yeah. yeah. Did you drive all the way over the 17 every time, every day? That's where I learned to drive. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What they, they call yeah. that like Blood Alley or something, right? Yeah, and I think especially now there's with all the commuters uh, from the Bay Area, it's something crazy like seventy three or seventy four thousand people every day are traveling across. So now it's mm -hmm. not only is everyone in a hurry, but it's pretty packed too. So yeah. grateful to have had yeah. a bit of my experience before it got really bad. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Um, when we first got our van in 2018, one of our first trips was just driving up north. And we drove from Santa Cruz to San Jose to go visit my brother on the 17th. And our power steering went out on the 17th. Like, for some reason... Brand new van. This is brand new. new. I mean, we, we had like hundreds of miles on the odometer. <laughs> and, you know, you're driving on those windy mountain roads. And then you have to, like, lean your whole body into the steering wheel <laughs> to make a turn. Or we're just going to careen off the side. But yeah, that was a recall, turns out, that they never never told us about. Yeah, but only happened once, yeah, that's, thank, yeah. thank goodness. <laughs> Between, I guess, power steering and brakes are probably the two things you don't want to have go out on that road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I would, I would prefer power steering go out than brakes. Because, you know, people <laughs> drove without power steering for decades, right? Like, oh. <laughs> but nobody drove without brakes very long. <laughs> yeah, man. That's awesome. Well, how long ago was that then? You guys have been on the road for 16 years. Is that what I saw the other day? Yeah, so that was 20, 2018. Yeah. Right? Because we got the van in twenty early 2018. So that was just before we uh, went to Europe. But yeah, so before that, we were in a couple other campers, and we did mostly the U.S. But 2018, 2016, we went international. So the, one of the things that we... Uh, that we talk about is like we spend so much time traveling the u.s and we used to have so many friends that are on the road traveling the u.s like you are now but all of those people have stopped traveling so when we came back from europe in 2022 it's like we didn't know anybody we had to make all new friends <laughs> we're like the we, new kids on the block and everyone's <laughs> like cool. who are these people <laughs> like you know because then like when we left you know we were we were five years younger, six years younger, and then we came back and we're, you know, we don't feel like we're five years older, but then everybody's like 15, 20 years younger than we are now, you know, so we dropped into like a whole different world, especially with COVID and all the different rules that are in place and all that stuff, which is, was wild. Yeah, so, a lot more people on the road too, I would imagine, than pre-pandemic. Uh, for sure, a lot yeah. more people on the road. Um, I mean, even before the pandemic, it felt like, you know this lifestyle was getting more and more popular there was there wasn't a stigma anymore like when we started and especially with you know people with families but it does seem like it became a lot more accessible to like younger people mm -hmm. just the way that the lifestyle like the way that you can make money you know the way that you can communicate with your friends and family still like so much easier than it used to be so i feel you know the accessibility has made made a big big impact on how many people are out there totally yeah and i mean do you now see too, a lot of people in baja still right now <laughs> uh yeah definitely a lot of people down here 
I've noticed more and more heading north. I think I got here and have been traveling a bit slower than a lot of the folks who came before. And so uh, at this point, people are starting to either slowly make their way back north or they're like, OK, you know, it's time to it's time to get yeah. back to the yeah. States. So it's really been yeah. clearing out uh, when I was coming south. Most people I passed were going back past me. But still, yeah. I think I've done an R8 job at staying in the the less populated areas now heading forward going to you know Cabo Pulmo and Cabo Todos Santos all of those areas I'm sure uh, it's still going to be pretty busy but I don't think yeah, Cabo um, Pulmo can be busy but the rest of the yeah. East Cape is so big and dispersed yeah. you'll be able so to find spots. you'll be able to find places all by yourself even at the peak of the season Awesome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And all of your recommendations have been so fun to, to watch and listen to. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, you got it. We felt like, you know, this this information was probably more useful like four months ago. <laughs> We're always a little late. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I think but I do it's think right great. now is the best time to be down there. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, having, I know you have the, the cats and, and kids, obviously, so temperature and climate definitely impact you as well. But uh, mm -hmm. my dog with, with her long hair, it's been a struggle this week. It's been 84 to 87. We hit 94 going over the mountains the other day. Wow. And uh, without AC in the camper, just fans and wind, we've been really working to stay cool. So I think that yeah. might cut the trip a little short if it continues to get hot this early, just because I want to make sure she's still comfy but i mean the water's been yeah. lovely when you get back to the pacific side it's going to be a little bit better because there'll be a stronger breeze well i mean la ventana and los barilas can get really breezy yeah but yeah, yeah it, it it is going to get warmer um i would say by like mid-march mm -hmm. early april it's going to get close to unbearable <laughs> this is the last good stretch yeah. probably yeah, and that was always my plan was to get down here after the new year. I got to spend some time with family, which was great for the holidays, and then came down just pretty early January. And so my turnaround time was, well, two or three months, depends on the weather, but probably that mid to end March, I'll be heading back north trying to escape the, the brunt of the heat because that's what I had cool. heard. Cool. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff ahead of you still. So you haven't gone to the west side of Baja, so you haven't gone, you're going to counterclockwise no clockwise right yeah clockwise cool. came through and stayed on one the whole way or i guess five the whole way down until we met one and then i've split mm -hmm. off a couple times back east just because uh everyone came down for a big event and so i was trying to stay north yeah. and a little bit more secluded and quiet as long oh, as i could man. that's and a then, good idea it's a good plan <laughs> yeah we were there last winter, <laughs> last winter last <laughs> winter during that big van event too and we were in cabo and yeah. it was like, we don't want to be in Cabo, but we'd rather be in Cabo than there. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, there were, I think, hundreds of thousands of people down here and just as I'm many sure. rigs. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, looks looks like a great time, just not quite our speed. So <laughs> I was happy no, to be on the beach. <laughs> and I've been fairly vocal and public about how this, how that event was organized and yeah. where it's organized and... There are all the reasons why it shouldn't be organized at that place in that manner. But, you know, I'm just one person. There's not a <laughs> lot that I can do. <laughs> yeah, well, you're not alone in it, I guess. I'll say that. Yeah. Uh, you're definitely not alone. There's a good number of us who feel similarly and chose not to go this year. And for everyone who did, glad that they had a good time. And I hope that they were able to, you know, respect the area and clean up and, yeah. and do everything that they should be doing to respect it. Have you been down to Baja before? Is this your first time? It's my first time. Yeah, my first time. So really taking it all in. Not even like on a family vacation to like a resort or anything? <laughs> okay, so I guess we spent three days in Cabo del San Jose a couple of years ago. But yeah, okay. I mean, we stayed at the resort. We flew in right. and flew out. Uh, didn't yeah. do actually really much international travel with my family growing up. So that was, I got my passport for that trip. And I think oh, I was wow. 17 or 18 so okay. yeah i didn't, didn't grow up doing a lot of that but we did a lot of camping so still got that uh travel and and a lot of the outdoors with my family which was great yeah what's that like so you know tell us a little bit about like how you grew up you said you grew up in northern california mm -hmm. and were you 
were you always from the coast? Like, was your family from there? Like, how far how far back of a Californian does your family go? Yeah, so I guess my great great grandparents were the first generation in California. They all immigrated oh, wow. from yeah, so they all immigrated from Italy and some from France and Germany. And then on my dad's side, uh, my noni was first generation here. And so she actually, her mom is from Mexico and then her dad was Swedish. And so, yeah, on that mm. side, I guess I'm what third generation. So since people have come to the States, everyone settled in California on both sides of my family and pretty much stayed in that um, Santa Clara area, San Jose area, right in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're all agriculture and orchard workers and owners growing up. So, yeah, that was, I mean, it's cool to have that piece of California history in my family. And I feel like it's always going to be home. Uh, but, yeah, just had this desire to see as much as I could. And when I turned 18, I went, you know, with my family to San Jose del Cabo. And I had done one trip in an RV up to Vancouver and Whistler area. So that was my That's only cool. other exposure. Yeah, really beautiful. But again, RV, you know, we stayed in a campground, went mountain biking. And that was really our speed growing up was a tent. Then we graduated to the RV and a lot of um, just trips out of California. So did your really parents own the RV or was it like a rental? Yeah, they actually ended up buying an RV, I think, in probably 2002 or 2003. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, when cool. My brother was three. Yeah. Are they still yeah. doing that? Do they still take trips? So sold that RV a little while ago, and it's actually okay. really I'm excited for them. In November, they sold their house in California, and they're now on the road full time as well, which is cool. Oh wow! wow. So yeah. you you don't have a place to build another rig. <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> no, I really don't, and that's a great question. It's something I've been grappling with. So um, I don't know if you have any recommendations. <laughs> I mean, this the the truck and Bigfoot looks like it should last. I mean, right? It's. A Great combo. I will say being down here, this has really been uh, the proving grounds, I'll say, in terms of going yeah. more off the beaten track. And this camper is home. I absolutely love it. It's so cozy. There's so much space for, you know, just myself. Um, but I do get a little bit nervous because the fiberglass is amazing for what it's made for. But it's right. not really made to flex and go off road a whole lot. So um, yeah. the truck is definitely more capable. And yeah, it's giving me some ideas for the future. And when they age a bit, the fiberglass can get a little brittle. But mm -hmm. seems like you, you, you now you've got some fiberglass repair experience. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I won't say it's uh, <laughs> the most beautiful work but it i mean it's held it's watertight and it's yeah it's been right long. that's that's all that matters right <laughs> yeah as long as it works yeah and we really enjoyed watching your build videos and you started off with a van and then you switched to a bus and now you're in the truck camper currently yeah a little bit of everything <laughs> which one was the hardest to build out you think so I guess for different reasons, the van and the camper, the bus was pretty straightforward and I did that really fast, honestly, eight weeks or so mm -hmm. it took me to build the bus, which for me at least is rapid pace. Uh, the van was hard because it was my first build and I did not know what I was doing. This was still a little bit before I would say uh, the bulk of the DIY how to build your rig videos went up on YouTube and so I, I pretty much just had one or two people that I could watch their video and then try to replicate it. And so I, I learned a lot in that build. I learned a lot about, you know, not only how to use tools and, and do things from both YouTube and my dad, who uh, gratefully provided the tools, but also just, you know, you make a lot of mistakes on your first one. So that was difficult mm -hmm. for those reasons. But I think restoring something, restoring this camper was a whole nother set of challenges, uh, working around things that already existed and trying to figure out what needed repairing versus replacing. But again, learned a lot. And if I ever do another build, I feel like I'll go into it, uh, you know, now with three builds behind me and knowing, knowing even more. So I'm grateful for it. Yeah. So what, um, what kind of RV are your parents in? How come they didn't do a home built? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so my parents are actually in a travel trailer now, which is okay. a little different. I guess maybe more akin to when y'all were in your Airstream. So yeah. pulling right. it behind. Yeah. And they really just wanted more space. They have a um, really large chocolate lab. He's like over 100 pounds with a whole lot of energy. 
and the two of them wow, they just a wanted couple, a little man. more space yeah he's huge <laughs> really big boy uh so yeah they wanted a little bit more space and i think they love that they can also detach and being able to get on the yeah. road faster for them was a priority i mean that's that's probably the biggest benefit i mean you know by now once you set up camp like you don't want to leave you know <laughs> is it worth it to pack it all up just to go, go get a loaf of bread or should i just yeah. eat a keto diet for the next three days <laughs> go catch some fish yeah. yeah especially in baja it's really gratefully I'm, I'm actually really enjoying it i shifted my perspective around food and access to things because not only mm -hmm. is it different being in baja versus you know california or arizona but also it's like once I get to camp, like right now to get out, I'm going to have to air down my tires, move my traction boards. It's probably going to take, you know, time in addition to breaking camp down. And then when you get yeah. to town, what even is there? So getting creative with my food and really just being satisfied with what I have is what I have has been a really eye opening experience. Uh, for I mean, me. sometimes you have to eat a couple meals straight out of a can, you know, for you to appreciate <laughs> the fresh stuff in life. Yeah, what can I make with corn and <laughs> cheese? Uh, there's some there's some sliced jalapenos. <laughs> what can I do with that? Maybe yeah. make a drink from it. Yeah, you're describing the contents of my fridge right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, oh, the thing about having a travel trailer that for your parents is it's 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 the perfect setup for traveling in the U.S. And that we were able to do it for so long, but I'd never go back to towing something again. Did you ever consider towing anything? I mean, it's for one one person traveling alone, male or female. It's a lot of effort. Totally. Yeah. You know, I, I did briefly consider it coming into this third rig just because I had seen a, a few videos of folks in like the scamp trailers. So much smaller yeah. still fiberglass. We used to have a casino. I was really, yeah. And I was really looking for reliability uh, coming from my bus that just broke down constantly on mm. me. I wanted something mm -hmm. reliable. And so I got, got the Toyota Tundra, an older 2006. And that was really the keystone for me, the keystone piece. And then from there it was, okay, well, maybe I put one of those little camper shells on it so I can have that portability and gear storage, and then I can yeah. drop a trailer. But I think, like you said, just not only the places that I want to go then would be more limited towing something, but also, you know, how often is it really that I'm going to want to drop a trailer and drive into town? And is it worth then having this much larger and I guess more difficult to, to maneuver rig, especially if I'm going through towns and whatnot? And this just seems yeah. more contained, more contained. Yeah, and it's always like, you know, when you come across an intersection, like, will I be able to reverse the entirety of this road if I had to while towing a trailer? Yeah. You know, it's different <laughs> when you have somebody that can go out there and, like, scout for you. But mm -hmm. being by yourself, you know, that's, yeah. a, that's another challenge. So that, that totally makes sense. And I think you'll find out, especially after being in Baja, like, International travel with your setup, yeah. it's 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 the ideal way to go. And you have a pretty yeah. well insulated setup for winter, right? I do, yeah. The coldest that we've stayed in, it was actually pre-heater as well and pre-renovation, but we were up mm -hmm. in Stanley, Idaho, I guess now two winters ago in this rig, and it was mm. right after I'd bought it. And it got down to seven degrees outside, uh, which oh, wow. for us, especially in a rig that, you know, had some mm -hmm. water issues and had some leaks going on that I didn't fully understand yet. Uh, moisture was an issue, but the cold, I mean, I sleep with a sleeping bag even now. I have a dog. It's dirty. I love being able to just shake it out. Yeah. Uh, and we were great. She just had her little rumple blanket that I wrapped her up in and I had on a jacket, went to bed and it was great. Uh, now that I have the heater as well. I think we've stayed, I think nine or 10 degrees is the coldest we've done this time around since the rebuild. And I won't say that we're, you know, toasty. It's not 75. And you here, have one of those like propane, <laughs> propane, like boat heaters. Is that what you use? Yeah, I do. I really like it because it actually circulates most of the moisture out, which is the biggest complaint with propane is that it's that wet heat. Yeah. But I found it to be exceptional and I don't have any condensation issues and it's really just nice to have that little glow of the fire too. It feels very homey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it looks really cool too, actually. Some people think it's ugly, but I think it looks really neat. <laughs> 
It's an accent piece, and especially, right? <laughs> especially being like in a fiberglass camper, it's got such like a marine boat feel. Yeah, it does. You know? Totally. Yeah, I appreciate you understanding the vibe I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. So you said you had a brother, a younger brother? Yeah. Do you have I other do. siblings or just the two of you? Just the two of us. Yeah, my younger brother, I guess he's, what, 20, 24 now. That's crazy. Uh, and he's out <laughs> in Grand Junction, Colorado. He went to school in Durango and then decided he, he cool. loved it enough. So him and his partner are there and not mobile, but his job is a couple weeks on, a couple weeks off. So they're actually also in a oh, trailer nice. now. And they is have he like a, a firefighter or something? The whole family is there. Yeah. <laughs> Is he like a firefighter yeah. or something? Or uh, No, he actually works as an engineer out in the mineral uh, deposits out oh. in Colorado. So, so he's like he in the mi go... works for a mining company. Yeah, pretty much. He's one of their project okay. engineers there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I don't know yeah, if you so have, but there. there's a lot of Canadians <laughs> in Baja and Mexico that work in the mining business. Yeah, we seem to meet a lot. We seem to meet every <laughs> Canadian that we come across is like, oh, I'm in mining. I'm a mining engineer. <laughs> I work in a mine. I retire from a mine. Like everybody's working in the mine. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think the oil, gas, and, and mineral industry up there is booming, especially in, you know, Alberta yeah. and provinces in the center of the country. But met a yeah, lot of Saskatchewan, folks in BC. I think. Yeah, Saskatchewan. A lot as of folks well. in BC. And a lot of Quebecians as well. A lot of French down here, which I wasn't really expecting. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean we've met a couple and and there was a there was an older couple that we met on the beaches of um, Cabo, like on the east end of Cabo, between San Jose del Cabo and yeah. Cabo San Lucas. Such an interesting, super cool older guy. He was like heavy machinery operator, but it's like you listen to this guy talk. He's like if like an American redneck spoke French. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Yeah, my um, but we didn't see that many. Redneck. Quebec Claws. I think maybe like two or three couple. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he's oh, the one that wow. stuck out the most. Dang. Yeah. No, when we, when I got to San Ignacio, I think I ran into two or three groups and each group had at least a dozen folks in it. Uh, a lot of wow. them on motorcycles too, which was an interesting way of travel all the way down and asked, you know, yeah. are you, are yeah. you yeah. taking your motorcycle off the rig? But they had driven all the way from Quebec. So it's, I'll give it to them. That's wow. pretty intense. Well, because I think, yeah. you know, people from the eastern side of Canada used to go to Florida. And now they're at the exchange rate so bad for them to be in the U.S. I think a lot more are opting to go all the way to Mexico instead just to kind of, you know, have a cheaper winter than being stuck up there. Or a new experience. Or a new experience. Yeah. But, you know, cheaper is always nice. <laughs> yeah. Got to travel with the economy. I understand that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I mean, it's even down in Ca uh, Baja now, it doesn't seem like as cheap as it used to be. But, you know, for us, it was different because we came back from Europe thinking the the, the U.S. was still priced in the 2018s. But, yeah, well, you know, well. it was culture shock. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. I think the thing that has surprised me the most with cost groceries, depending on where I've been, have been similar, maybe slightly, slightly less money, but the gas here. And I had heard just briefly, yeah, the gas oh, is more. California prices, but I don't think I've ever paid $130 for a 26 gallon tank of gas in California. It's been pretty, pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, anywhere outside of, of the U.S., it's pretty brutal we've not really been anywhere outside of the u.s where we feel like you know that's reasonable like the most we paid i want to say was close to nine dollars a gallon and this yeah. is at the beginning of the pan no at middle. the end in the middle of the pandemic just before we came back it was in france i was trying to get gas for the van and as i was swiping my card or inserting my card the price changed went up and like in the moment so Why I, isn't this I, working? I took my thing out i was like i don't know if i got charged the lower price or the higher price but i guess it doesn't matter it's, it's, it's like nine bucks or nine bucks and ten cents but totally. it, it's insane yeah you know i mean i think it makes it makes people realize like how good we have it in the u.s when it comes to fuel fuel prices even california prices is not 
you know, it doesn't compare to how much other people have to pay. And then you look at these people that live in these countries that don't make a lot of money. How can they afford? You know, how can they afford to get gas? There's a there's a bit of a two tier economy in foreign countries outside of the U.S. and Europe. In that, like the locals pay a certain price for things, and then the tourists pay a certain price for things. But that only that only applies for you know like tourism activities. But food and gas, I mean, those are staples that everybody more or less pay the same for, and yeah. it's a tough way to live, you know, for the people that don't make that much money. Totally, yeah, that's definitely been on my mind, especially passing through some of the more rural inland towns in Baja. Is, I mean, how could you afford to drive, you know, outside of your region? Just it's,、mm-hmm. I mean, you put yourself in their shoes and make the wages that they're making, and it's like that's, you know, half a month's wage possibly that you're spending on a tank of gas or two. So, no, I can really appreciate the the privilege that. We have not only bringing a foreign dollar here that is stronger,、uh, economically speaking, but also to just the amount of money that's being made here. It really puts things into perspective. Yeah, what's been your favorite places so far in Baja? Ooh, so I really love San Ignacio. I think just as far as a town goes, and more of the seeing more of the culture, I guess,、uh, if you will,、mm-hmm. of Baja or Mexico, just because I think the further south I've gotten, the more、uh, gringos that there have been, and、yeah. you know,、sure. inherently,、yeah. that less middle、culture. part of Baja is magical. Like away、yeah. from the north, away from the south,、yeah. in the middle, either people are just passing through, or people who are flying in just never get that far. So yeah, totally. I totally agree. That middle part's amazing. Yeah, so San Ignacio has been great, and I'm really excited to check out a couple more of the towns that I did just pass through on my way south as we head north.、Um, would love to actually stay in Guerrero Negro a little bit longer too. I did get those tacos at Muele, and they were、oh, those、bomb. tacos. They were so、oh, good. good, so good. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah, we had some friends that that was just there yesterday and sent us photos. Yeah, like oh, yeah. Uh, I know we're in Costa Rica, but really jealous of Baja. <laughs> yeah. Costa Rica、Shoot. doesn't hold a candle to Baja. <laughs> so don't say it too loudly. People, okay, sorry, sorry, we're <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah, well, I would absolutely love to do a trip through Central and South America one day. So in reverse, grass is always greener. I'm just like, oh, I hope that I get to make it that、yeah. far one day. It looks <laughs> epic. Yeah, I mean, I was just saying today that、um, I can see the appeal of why people like it here. I mean, there's.、Mm-hmm. A lot to like about it, but I also feel like that the golden era of like people that are moving down here, expats relocating to Costa Rica, is probably behind us. Ten, twenty years ago, people coming down here would have found, you know, some kind of like paradise at the end of the rainbow. But I think the secrets, for sure. Not a secret anymore. I think it's also now it's for people that are more well off. It's not quite. Take your U.S. dollar and have it last longer here. Yeah, there's always going to be a different place, right? Maybe it's going to have to be Nicaragua. If we can get a,、yeah. if we can get the the autocrat out of the out of the government. I saw in your foil camper video that you said you went to school near Sacramento. I assume maybe you went to school in Davis. Where'd you go to school? I did. Yeah, I went to school at UC Davis, and you really did a lot of research. That's awesome.、Uh, yeah. <laughs> Woodland is very close. It was our neighboring town. I used to ride my bike out there、uh, on like training、cool. rides. But went to UC Davis. I studied environmental science and management, and absolutely loved my time there. It is such a cool little town.、Uh, really farm to table in terms of your access to fresh food. The community is wonderful and bikeable. And I apologize. We have the first sand buggies. Oh, of the that's day. Los Feliz. That's that. That's that's all across Los Burritos. <laughs> yeah, so many, so many. But、uh, yeah, went to UC Davis. Really, really loved it there, and graduated about four months before the pandemic started. So I, I finished up in winter of 2019,、mm. and well,、wow, that's very lined up. fortunate. Yeah, because <laughs> I yeah, feel like a year later、course. you would have not had this the college experience you were hoping for. Totally, yeah. I mean, even if I had taken one extra semester, right, I would have been graduating、yeah. virtually online, and so I—that、yeah. was my brother's、mm. experience, unfortunately. So I, I witnessed it through him, but 
yeah, had the full college experience and then, yeah, moved, moved away and got my first big girl job that wasn't working as a, a cashier at Trader Joe's. And again, was super <laughs> fortunate to have that lined up going into the pandemic because I feel like without it. Though I do hear Trader uh, Joe's would... pay pretty well. <laughs> they do. They do. Yeah, and it's you get those cool too. Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So enjoyed it though. So you were living in the city? So I was living, actually, at first, I didn't go straight into that government job that I had in the city. I moved down to Monterey, which is just south of okay. Santa Cruz. Yep. And my degree was in environmental science, but I specialized in soils. So kind of a niche there. But I was working as a soil specialist for a commercial mushroom company. So the mushrooms okay. that you buy at Costco, Monterey Mushrooms, that's who I was working for at first. Oh, wow. And... Uh, yeah, without saying too much about it, the um, the atmosphere at that job was not great. The practices mm. around the pandemic were mm -hmm. less than ideal. And so I pretty soon after, within about eight months, uh, was looking for a different job and a slightly different career. I realized that I really liked working with people. And even if that was virtually, um, as opposed to being in a lab by myself, that's where I wanted to go. And that's how I ended yeah. up in that next position. I was working uh, for San Mateo County. So much more like proper Bay Area at that point. Right. Um, yeah. So even though you had a a normal pre-pandemic college experience, you had a very different the start of your professional career sounds like. Totally. Yeah. I feel like all the rules were thrown out the window and it was my first yeah. experience. I mean, it had internships, right? But as a, a salaried employee, really, I guess just a tumultuous time. That's the best I can say. Yeah. Didn't know what to expect already. Just it being my first step into a career and then everything yeah, just changed really rapidly. Had it been different? Do you think it would have been different if the pandemic... I mean, obviously, the, if the pandemic didn't happen, a lot of things would be different. But for specifically for your sort of start of your professional career, you think you would have stayed? Did you enjoy that job to the extent where if that wasn't a factor, you would have stayed there? So I don't think so. And no. I maybe unpopular opinion and I don't want to say, you know, I'm grateful for the pandemic. That's definitely not where I'm, I'm trying to take this or what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I mean, there, there are for sure good things that came out of it. A lot of bad things, but yeah. there are some good things that came out yeah. of it. Well, I think for me, it was just a reminder of what I really wanted in life. Uh, and I'm grateful yeah. to have had that pretty young, but actually before I even went to UC Davis, I had considered purchasing a van because rent was so ridiculous. I was like, well, what if I just lived in a, like a VW or something that, that would work. Mm -hmm. And Davis is definitely not a great place to do that being such a small, uh, yeah. urban area. And it's, it's pretty hot, pretty hot in the summer. <laughs> yeah. I guess you have to go to Santa Cruz summer. in the summer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I had considered it before and thought about it in the past, but just never took the leap. And so having this experience, graduating almost into the pandemic, a lot of the ups and downs with my ups and downs with my career, and then transitioning to that remote position with the government. I just sat there one day, and I at the time was struggling a lot with mental health too, which I think a lot of us mm. were during the pandemic, and just thinking, gosh, you know, I've worked all these years, gone to school all these years for this, you know, to pay half my salary in rent to live with five other people, to sit at a desk all day and just like wait to, to punch the clock and be done. And mm -hmm. is this really all that there is? And so that realization came after a meeting with my manager who said, well, you know, when you go to retire in 45 or 50 years and my heart just stopped. <laughs> Yeah. Well, wow, that, whoever that is that. really has a way with words. <laughs> yeah, I will never forget that conversation. And it just that day I, I sat there in my room p mid pandemic and just went, this feels right now, again, mental health included, like a low in my life. And if this feels mm -hmm. this low, it's like I got to try something because the worst case is I end up right back here. And that was kind of the catalyst for me trying to pursue <clears throat> all this. Did you live in the city? Were you living in San I Francisco? Lived just south, just south. Yeah. So, um, okay. for anyone who's familiar, like, like the San Mateo Hillsdale area, yeah, San Mateo. Hillsdale. Okay. Yep. I mean, I don't know how that area is, but since then, there's been a lot more crime in San Francisco. Like, had that already started when you were still there? Yeah, some of it had, and I think too, there is a lot 
going on in terms of social movements, like the Black Lives Matter mm-hmm. movement was really not starting, obviously, but coming into the forefront. A lot of the protests had had started in recent months as well um, between that and, you know, just social welfare uh, conversations really picking up speed during this time. And so being in the city was an interesting or being near the city was an interesting mm-hmm. experience at this time. Again, being younger as well and kind of just like thrust into all of this unexpectedly. Um, I didn't have to deal with the crime myself, but I think it just everything felt very tense. You could feel Mm -hmm. uh, the tension in the air when you went outside or when you went anywhere, really. Yeah, I think maybe during that time, I'm guessing that was like 21, 22. Yep. It feels like during that time, that tension was there everywhere because we felt it in Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, when we travel across, we during the first year of the pandemic, we just didn't leave where we were. We stayed put for that whole year. And then when we first felt comfortable to leave the area or cross the border, it seemed like everywhere we went, you know, mask up, don't touch anything. Even though, like, you know, the vaccine was out, but there was so much mutation, we didn't know if it was effective. So I feel like, you know, like you said about the mental well-being of everybody, took a toll globally. It wasn't just big cities or because we were in a tiny village we're in a tiny village of like 50 people. But we can avoid all that. We can avoid it all. Well, a big city stress. Like we yeah, but still, then, there, then there's small. different types of stress, <laughs> you know? Yeah. We, had to go, we had to go shop for groceries. And every time we went shopping, we bought so much food to, so we don't have to come back. And it got to the point where like, the, the grocery store clerk asked us if we were pro- provisioning a sailboat for, <laughs> for crossing. <laughs> we're like, no, they're just... There's five of us, and they're growing, they're eating a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Well, and I imagine, too, experiencing that time abroad where you maybe don't have access to as much of your community back home, and then also with your kids yeah. must have been such a wild experience. Yeah, I mean, that's. I think that's one of the big things. When we came back from the U.S., I mean, when we came back to the U.S., we uh, we sought out people that that we could, you know relate with and be friends with and you know it's been uh it's been a really really interesting experience being abroad during that time and then being back for a little bit and now we're abroad again you know Mm -hmm. so it's it doesn't feel as far away as it is now but you know it's it's definitely something that we had to take a little time to kind of get used to but sorry for you you know it's interesting because your parents are now full time and your brother lives on the road now part time or on vacation. But yeah, he's um, stationed what, when he's at work. He'll be there, but then um, he's able to yeah. to be more mobile when he's so he's full time in the camper, or just stationary part time. Yeah. So, was any of this like influenced by your choice to live full time, or were they always thinking this? Mm. I don't think they were always thinking this. I don't think any of us necessarily were um, up until a point that we were, obviously. But yeah, yeah, I think for my parents, at least, they have shared. And if they're watching this when this uh, is played back, hi, mom and dad. Uh, Hello, Alexandra's parents. (laughs) Yeah, I think they definitely have expressed that they're really proud of me for pursuing a life that I want to live, if that's outside of the norm. Uh, And I think to an extent they've wanted to travel and see the country at least uh, stateside like I have. So maybe in that sense, but in reverse, I would say that they've also inspired me to be here, right? They inspired that love for the outdoors and the appreciation of culture and people from areas that aren't where we're originally from. So I think it right. kind of comes back around to them maybe now, but they were definitely yeah. my... Well, you beat them to the punch. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then my brother, I think for him, it just made sense. He had considered living on the road around the same time uh, that I got on the road, but was in college still. So it didn't mm-hmm. make a lot of sense, especially Colorado in the winter is pretty brutal uh, in the areas yeah. that he's yeah. been in, so... When he graduated, he also went straight into the workforce and didn't make a lot of sense for him to try to pursue life on the road full time in the same way that I do. 
but mm-hmm. I think for him, it's a great way to, to, to save money. I think a lot of people, even outside my family, you know, are finding, well, do I, do I need to buy a house or do I want to be able to be mobile if the opportunity presents and maybe save my money for that? And so I think that's more where his mindset has been. But I hope he does get to experience yeah. the travel component more so one day as well. Have you done any traveling with them, with your parents or your brother, since you've been on the road? Have they, like, I mean, your parents, especially, if, if they're full-time, they have more yeah. flexibility, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this uh, past winter, actually, so they got on the road in November, and I was up in the Oregon, Washington area at that time, and we immediately met up down in Washougal, Washington. I have some family that's in Portland, and so... We hung out in that area and actually all got an Airbnb for Thanksgiving, which was really nice to see everyone and have laundry and showers. We all have that appreciation now for Mm -hmm. a a timely Airbnb. (laughs) And then we met up again for Christmas down in Las Vegas. So kind of did the snowbird migration and spent part of that holiday season together as well before I came down to Baja. So it's been really fun. Uh, We were camping out by Lake Mead right before the holidays and got to Mm -hmm. show them some of my version of travel since with the travel trailer, they do stick more to the the main roads. And that was super cool to be lakeside and, and show them a little bit more in person, you know, what I get to do all the time. Yeah, the Lake Lake Mead Government Point BLM that's I mean we spent a lot of time there even with our trailer back in the day and you know show them that it's definitely possible and for us like at the beginning we spent a lot of time in campgrounds but yeah we're like oh I think we're just supposed to be in RV parks (laughs) with like retired couples (laughs) so that's cool that you can show them that there's a whole like boondocking culture and um yeah yeah, there's how does Lake Mead look How, how did it look when you were there was it I hear that it's getting a little bit better in terms of water level or trash yeah. and people yeah all of the above uh, water. Oh. yeah <laughs> maybe trash is worse <laughs> all the people extra people go in there you know honestly so this was my third i guess season having gone back three years in a row now to the havasu and mead areas and trash was minimal people seem to be doing a really great That's job good. which is really nice to see uh, these lands being taken care of especially as more people have gotten on the road it's not always the case so yeah i was excited to see that and i don't know i was calling it kind of my budget baja before i knew if i could come all the way down here because just wide open beaches i was down on mead myself didn't see anyone for seven days um and the water level was was great so yeah i mean it's it's lovely as ever highly recommend if you guys are back in the states to to visit because it was great cool we were just saying the other day how much we miss winter in the desert in the southwest desert like nevada arizona california because that was our stomping grounds from like november until march basically (laughs) every year yeah yeah Yeah. and there's nothing like it really when you go abroad you know, what ends up happening is that you find outside of Baja and Central America, Mexico, there's far less like free wild camping options, Mm -hmm. you know, so you really, you really are spoiled in the U.S. And then when you leave, you kind of have to shift your expectations a little bit because otherwise, you know, you could be really disappointed with what you have to do, especially where we are now. It's so hot when you get to low elevation. We're, just, we're in a little cabin. Yeah, we're in like AC. a. <laughs> but we're high enough. We're four thousand feet now, so we're high enough. Where we don't have to run the AC. But yeah, this you know, it's it's rough. But yeah, totally. like, I know that the smell of the desert with the creosote yeah. and yeah, you know, it's the best. when the temperature drops at night, like I just love that. So good. Yeah, I will admit. Again, grass is always greener. I'm so grateful to be here in Baja. But when I woke up this morning and the air was still, it was probably 81, 82 when the sun <laughs> rose at 720. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh, man, should I head back to Arizona? <laughs> <laughs> it is hot. It is hot. Yeah. And, yeah, there's just something special about the desert of the Southwest. And, I mean, yeah. even the southern portion of the eastern sierra one of my favorite spots on the ground no matter where i've been and this time of year it's great because you just throw on a jacket and some pants and it's the perfect temperature big mountain backdrops it's just it's so a little bit less people and hot springs yeah hot springs (laughs) 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like starting from like Ridgecrest, Trona Pinnacles, all the way up. Yeah. You know, yeah. past Good Mammoth. Spot. We were there, yeah. so we hadn't been there since 2017, and we were just mm-hmm. there this past summer uh, for a couple weeks. We went from first time driving over Tioga Pass from Yosemite. Yeah, no, Tioga Pass was was something that we finally got to do since we borrowed. We also borrowed the four wheel camper, like you did. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, yeah. they were, they've been super nice to us. Like, we were just hoping to borrow it for a couple of days to go to Overland Expo. But, you know, they were, they're just like, take it. Take it for a couple months while you're here. And how was that experience for you? And I know from seeing a couple of your videos about it, it was it was during a transitional phase for you. Right? Because you had been fed up with the bus, basically. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So just very briefly, my bus, I had had it for about four months at this point, I think, maybe three and a half, and started having transmission issues. I thought, okay, Mm. shoot, this could be the death of the bus dream. Just because I, the reason I switched to the bus was vans had skyrocketed in price with, you know, the rage of van life. And Mm -hmm. so I went to the bus to hopefully save money and budget, have some Mm -hmm. more in the bank. And so when I blew through almost $20,000 in mechanical repairs in three months, it's like okay this yeah. is no longer the budget option uh what's yeah. what's next because i i was going to run out of money even though i'm still making money online it just was not enough to offset a cost let alone if i continued having issues so i sold that and i actually don't tell u-haul but i threw all my stuff in a u-haul and was camped out in the back of a u-haul for a little while i could tell that was a u-haul <laughs> even though you didn't show it in the video <laughs> yeah they apparently can ban you for life from that which really? Hopefully, I, yeah. I mean, you're definitely not supposed wow. to live in. Um, I mean, but, you know, I mean, Bob works. Wells from Cheap RV <laughs> Living like has made videos about how this is a great idea. Maybe there's a rule. I mean, it worked yeah, well. Maybe, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it worked well. I've considered it. Like, it's cheaper than getting a hotel, especially if you don't put any miles on it. Totally. Yeah, and that was the thing, right, of my money is dwindling, so getting a hotel or an Airbnb is not the move here, Uh, and I also needed wheels, so that was where the U-Haul came in, and it was pretty good timing. My cousin was actually getting married back in California, so I traded that in, rented a car, drove my dog and I back to California, and while I was there, I pretty much made up my mind, you know, I think the bus has to go. It was still in Portland, Mm -hmm. uh, getting a fix, getting a new transmission. So I had already paid for that, already out the money, but I posted my bus for sale and a good friend of mine actually ended up buying it and since has had not a single issue. So I'm so grateful for that. (laughs) Yeah, Um, You know, they knew everything that had happened, but it was all under warranty. So I I told them that and said, good luck to you. It's been great. (laughs) So hopefully that remains the same. Well, good for them, but kind of sucks for you. <laughs> right? It's like everything but the engine was brand new, and my fear was that the engine was going to go. So uh, thankfully, that yeah. has not happened yet. But yeah, I came back down, and I thought, what am I going to do next? You know, I've sold my bus. I'm in a rental car. I need I need a house. And was in California, so I had seen a couple of people working with four-wheel campers on this kind of trial basis and thought, you know what? I'm just going to shoot my shot. I'm going to reach out and plug that I went to UC Davis. I have that local street cred, hopefully. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Worked with Dan over at Four Wheel Campers, and it was an awesome experience. It was also when I first started thinking about the truck camper. So it was a really great way for me to try this kind of different style of travel, and I absolutely fell in love with it. So it's definitely my uh, gateway to the Bigfoot. So you think pre, pre Four Wheel Camper loner, you weren't considering truck camper? I think Were you thinking I just, another at van? That point, I was not sure, honestly. Just I thought about the scamp potentially, like the pull behind yeah, trailer, right. but wasn't in love with that for the reasons we talked about. Vans were still astronomical in Expensive. price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I started to think, you know, I've, I've done the build thing a couple times now. Maybe I'll get one of those, um, like, enclosed toy, not uh, like a toy hauler, but the small little, like, eight-foot-long trailers, and I'll just build that out pretty quickly. It's oh, yeah, like a little walls. teardrop or something. Yeah. yeah, I was like, how hard can that be, you know, enough space for us and our gear, and then I can get a reliable truck. So I was already on yeah. the thought of maybe I can get a reliable truck. And so it was a pretty quick jump as soon as I got okay. in the four-wheel camper of – this is actually super cool and I can go on these, you know, fun little ATV type trails compared to, you know, what the bus could do. So 
Yeah, hadn't really made the jump yet, but as soon as I got into it, it was a pretty easy choice. But not a full wheel camper. I mean, for sure not a new one, right? Because they're pretty spendy. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I could have afforded it, I might have jumped straight into that. I'll say it uh, <laughs> now and tomorrow. My dream is one of their flatbed models. I think, you know, it's just uh, so luxurious and, and exciting mm -hmm. to think about having all that space and capability. But definitely just out of my budget and didn't want to go into debt for something like that necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and have a you know, big loan out. So, yeah, that's why I, I chose the older truck. It's an 06 with low miles, and it's been, knock on wood, very reliable for me. And then the camper that I fixed up. I mean, you can't, you can't get a more reliable truck than an early Tundra, I don't think. That's what I've heard, and that's, that's definitely been my experience. I bought it with 109,000 miles on it, one owner, wow. uh, an older guy who used to take it fishing. And I don't think you can really do much better than that in terms of a, <laughs> yeah, an old right. truck find. <laughs> There's not a lot of wear and tear to the truck when you're fishing. <laughs> yeah, right. They were like, well, he did tow, and his boat, I guess, was one of those like seven or eight foot little fishing boats. Okay, okay. right. That's like right. a little dinghy. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think we're okay. <laughs> I do feel bad, though, for these older guys that are, like, selling their motorhome, selling their boat, selling their trucks, selling all this stuff. It's like, you know, it's a good deal for me, but, you know, yeah. is it, like, a sad date for them, like, when they have to let it go, you know? Yeah, but, yeah. If I ever let this truck go, it will be a sad day for me. If I, I've, yeah. like, we were talking about, you know, I've thought about what might be on the horizon. And I think for me, that move would be towards a more capable camper because the truck is, you know, it can do more than I would ever dare to do, I think, in terms of just mm -hmm. my travel style. But um, yeah, I, I'm going to try to hold on to this truck as long as I can. Oh, yeah. I mean, as far as capabilities go, the sky's the limit for that platform. You know, people are people take early Tundras around the world, you know, if, mm -hmm. if that's what you desire to do at some point. Yeah, that's the other bit, too, is the international portion, is I'm so tall and so large that it would be limiting in a lot of ways, I think. So having something a little bit more mobile. You yeah. can't fit into a container, I assume. You're probably 9, 10 feet tall. I'm over 10 feet tall, and that's exactly what, over I'm, 10 feet what tall. I'm thinking about next is... In the future, fingers crossed it works out, I would love to do something like the Pan Am or potentially more international travels and shipping is definitely a big consideration when that you know comes to mind. So looking mm -hmm. into more secure ways to ship a vehicle, I think going into a container is the best and you know, especially when it's your home and all of your belongings. So yeah, if I do anything in the future, it would be something much shorter. In your sort of early videos, like because you've gone through so many vehicles and now all the way to the truck and then the Bigfoot, how how has your sort of content creation experience been from the beginning? And if you go back, you know, because one of the first things we do is we go back to people's feed and see where it starts. <laughs> first video. <yeah. laughs> a lot of people started with like a van tour or a truck or a camper tour or stuff like that. Did you have aspirations for YouTube at the beginning or did you have other videos that you just kind of threw up there and maybe like hid them because they're not they don't fit in to the to the channel yeah maybe you saw my Instagram story the other day with my different uh, thumbnails if that's where this question's coming from um, oh no I don't know if I saw that yeah, did you yeah. okay okay I was like huh that's, that's not you <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think that I just really was looking for a creative outlet during the pandemic. And so all the way back, I think my first video that's not up any longer, but I can send you the unlisted link if you'd like to see how bad it is. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was, We've got yeah, so just, many bad videos going back to like, <laughs> you know, 2007. Yeah, it was like probably yeah, 360p exactly. is the resolution we uploaded in or 480p oh, maybe. So I had a bit of a leg up there. Yeah, a bit of a leg up there. I think 1080 is where I started, but still. Okay. Yeah. No, even for a while, I was like, oh, nobody needs 1080. I just go 720. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially when you're uploading off a hotspot, if you don't have Starlink, you know, it doesn't make sense to use all your data for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you upload something and you're like, oh, man, I screwed up. I got to fix it and re-upload a new one. That was the worst when I was running on the, like, the limited data plan. It was always such a bummer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So how, how but, has uh, it been for you? What was your sort of, you know, be beginning of your content creation 
process. Were you always were you always sharing on social media as comfortable as you are now? Definitely not. I think yeah. again, pre pandemic, I was very much just a general user of Instagram and uh, I would watch some YouTube, but I actually wasn't even consuming that much long form content. It never, mm -hmm. I guess, really occurred to me until the pandemic when I had all this time and started watching people on YouTube and thought, this looks kind of fun. Uh, so I went down to Best Buy and I had to order it online. She couldn't go into the store. And I got a little uh, Sony A6000, like the very lowest, cool. lowest Sony that you could get. And yeah. I don't know why I thought anybody cared, but I did like a 20 questions about me video on YouTube. And I just threw it up there and thought, this is embarrassing. And my, what if my family and friends watch? <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> well, why, why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after it's time, live, you thought about this, yeah. not while you're well, making it. You know, I'm surprised that I, w I look extremely uncomfortable in the video, but I am surprised that I actually had the courage to post something. Uh, and again, in hindsight, I'm like, why does anyone care what my favorite color is? No one knows who I am. Uh, but again, I posted it and it went live and I thought, oh, that was kind of fun. And I feel like maybe unlike some of the creator friends that I know, I actually really love editing. And that's where my joy comes from in terms of you know content creation. And so I fell in love with the editing process and just having something to so deeply focus on creatively uh, and try to hone that skill that I kept up with it, I think, for that reason. And so okay. when I got into the van you know, van life style uh, of content. Actually, at that point, I wasn't even really posting very consistently. It was just whatever I kind of felt like it. I thought, oh, this could be, you know, kind of fun. And I've seen a few people who have been documenting their builds and I'm learning from them. And I think my hope was that in just sharing my journey, not knowing at all what I was doing, maybe I could serve as a bit of an inspiration like others had to me of, wow, yeah. she doesn't know what she is doing at all. Her video skills are terrible, but she's doing it anyways. Uh, and yeah, I guess I just looked up to a lot of people during that time and hoped maybe I could even be a glimpse of that for somebody else, which is why I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say your video skills were terrible, you know, go, <laughs> even going back to some of your early videos, because honestly, the bar on YouTube is pretty low. Like, you can be up at the top 10% just by wanting to do better, right? And I think, but I think it's getting past that, like getting to the point where you can make a living on it. That's the, that's the real challenging part. And it's funny that you said that you love editing. Is that something that you have experience in or is that something that you just kind of had to learn and figure it out once you got into it? Yeah, learned and figured it out. But in hindsight, I was always the person when we had to make like a, a physics iMovie video. I'm thinking back to high school. Like I always volunteered to do it. I really, I don't know, I loved editing software even back to, you know, iMovie and those very basic free ones that came on your computer way back when. So I, I think mm -hmm. I always had that interest, but never considered myself to be much of a creative artistic person. I went to school for, you know, science and that was my thing. I was the science girl. So just never really explored it much. And it's been really cool to explore that side of myself and my passion for now trying to get a good shot and tell a story because it's definitely not something that I envisioned for myself even a few years ago. What type of, what kind of, I mean, I assume you're on a, you're on a MacBook. Do you, are you on Final Cut Pro, Premiere, DaVinci? Which one, what platform are you using? Yeah. Final Cut Pro, and I'm exploring DaVinci, but I use that word very carefully because it is such a big platform. I don't know how anybody, you know, fully learns DaVinci, uh, but that's no, my goal right. is eventually to, to really be working on DaVinci mostly. I think it's a super powerful platform. Mm -hmm. We just made the switch this last year, and I'm proud to say I have an open premiere in probably a good six months, nice. but... Um, I think the motivation going from Premiere as a subscription service to DaVinci is much more um, significant because Final Cut Pro, like, you don't have to pay a monthly fee. You already own it. Yeah, well, and I think I shied away from Premiere. When I very first started, I thought, well, everyone uses Premiere, it looks like, right? When you Google how to do YouTube, everyone says... Yeah, all the tutorials know. are in Premiere, right? <laughs> yeah, pay for, pay for and download Premiere. And I did, I think, maybe my first month download Premiere. And not only for the level that I was creating at then, but even now, 
uh, was it very overwhelming? It's just such a powerful tool that I didn't feel like I would even use half of necessarily at the time. Mm. But also I had seen and heard a lot of folks having issues where they'd edit the whole video and they hit export and the whole thing would lose, it would lose their whole project. Or especially when getting on the road, you know, with the lack of internet connection that I had, there would be connection problems or, you know, the file yeah. sizes are massive. So I think for just simplicity sake, I shied away and I found that with add-ons and plugins, Final Cut can do 80% maybe of what Final or of what Premiere can and 100% mm -hmm. of what I need to do. So it's been great so far. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's tons of features in Final Cut that al almost nobody uses, you know? Totally. So I think to switch to DaVinci would just be like a cool, hip, trendy kid move, but you know, it's not necessary. <laughs> Are you a trendy, yeah. hip, cool No, I'm, I'm, I'm a cheap, I'm a cheap, I'm a cheap editor who doesn't want to pay the monthly fee anymore. Yeah, but we still I end mean, up paying the monthly fee because I still use Photoshop and Audition, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, I think for me, the, the draw for DaVinci is now that I feel like I have my workflow down a little bit better, I really want to mm -hmm. start getting more creative with things like color grading and shooting in yeah. log profiles or Cinetone profiles on yeah. Sony. And so that's kind of the next step for myself, at least, is, okay, now I, I have the basics down. I feel like I understand my camera. Let's explore this additional, I guess, just artistic path. And I think DaVinci is really powerful in terms of color. You feel very comfortable on the camera. Is that something that you think you naturally had? Of course, it's a little awkward, like your first video, but <laughs> you seem very natural. Like, what is your trick to... I'm very nervous on the camera. I'm, like, nervous right now. <laughs> so what she are your is. tips she to is. being... I just like... I like watching your videos. I mean, I, I can tell how difficult it is because for you, being a solo traveler with your dog, a lot of the times it's challenging to kind of turn the camera on and start talking because, you know, there's nobody there to hear you but the camera. So you have to almost put your mind in the way that, like, there's a person behind this camera that I'm talking to, right? How, what is your process to get comfortable in front of the camera? Totally. It's definitely gotten easier. I will say that. Again, I can send you those first few videos if you have any interest or if you need a good laugh. Uh, the robotic gestures, and I, I was so uncomfortable. Um, so I think a lot of it has just come with time and practice. Now I've been doing this really consistently since, I guess, early 2022. So two years now of I'm posting every single week or as close to as I can. Mm. And I think it's just a skill that I've had to try to develop. I also think, though, too, one of my favorite parts about doing this work is being able to meet the people who watch the videos in person or like this mm -hmm. virtually and to hear feedback and oh, I really enjoyed this and that or it's been so cool mm -hmm. to watch because it allows me to imagine those people then when I sit down to record. It's like I'm telling a story for those people who are tuning in every week, that community that I have now gratefully gotten to know, whether again online or in person at events or Overland Expos. It's been so fun to get to meet them because it does allow me to imagine the people that I'm creating for and not just my camera because, yeah, staring into a black hole is not the most inspiring thing usually. <laughs> yeah, remembering to look at the lens, not the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I still I still mess that one up often. I'm like, oh wow, my hair is looking funky today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which Overland Expos were you at? Yeah, I went to Overland Expo West in Flagstaff, and that was my okay. first event. But I think this year I'm gonna try to go to at least three of them. Um, probably oh, wow. West again in Flagstaff. My brother's mm -hmm. actually getting married in Colorado right around the time that Mountain West is happening. So oh, I'll, I'll go there. Cool. And then I usually end up in the Pacific Northwest late summer and fall. So I think, yeah, my trajectory this year is going to make sense for me to try to go to all three uh, and really yeah. get more involved in the Overland community. Because it's, I don't want to discourage anybody and say it's, it's different in a uh, clicky way, but it's definitely different than the general van population I found or the school bus population. So it's been cool to explore, I guess, this additional community that I didn't feel like I really had access to in the past. Yeah. I mean, we've only been to three. And our first one was in 22. when, And it was also Flagstaff. And our motivation 
I think I mentioned a little bit earlier back then was just the lack of a community that we felt over the pandemic and being overseas for four years. And we really felt like that we needed to kind of reconnect with people. And we were luckily able to do that at Flagstaff really well. Um, and the, since then, we've been to Mountain West that same year. And then we went to uh, PNW last year. Mountain West was just okay. I mean, you have to be there anyway because your brother's wedding, but... But we had a yeah. lot of classes. So I think we were stressed because it's the first time we were teaching classes. Okay. So... It was, yeah. a, it was a lot of stress. But we also had a lot of classes in PNW this last time too. But PNW was much more fun. I think mostly because that, that Loveland uh, County Fairground location is not the best. It was dusty. And it can be a little hot. And then you're camping yeah. kind of in dirt. So, you know. Hmm. Good to You're know. Such a glamper, Dan. I'm such a glamper. Dan's a glamper. Yeah. He needs his lawn. Yeah. I need I need real showers, not that like scrubby thing that they try to sell you in yeah. the corner. The geyser, I think, system or whatnot. The geyser, yeah. right. It'd be really nice to have one of those geysers, geysers right now. It's true. That's true. Yeah. I mean, it's a good yeah. idea. I don't. I, I shouldn't talk too much smack about it. No. For sure. No, I'm really excited though to go to Flagstaff. Flagstaff was an awesome event and the camping, I mean, really cool. Yeah, I thought, Flagstaff camping is the, the best. Yeah. The walk was a bit yeah. far and my dog is yeah. uh, very stubborn. So there was a lot of her on my shoulders <laughs> oh, no. if anyone saw me. I had a lot of people going, you're such a good dog, mom. It's like the mile and a half walk back. Oh my She's God. Just you... On your on shoulders? shoulders. <laughs> yeah. Well, because it's so far, I can only carry her in my, you know, my biceps are not the strongest. So shoulders is much easier. And uh, yeah, we'll have wow. to work on that for this year. I bet doggy <laughs> stroller next year, yeah. doggy backpack. What about those four <laughs> oh legs? God. Those four legs got to do something. Well, and it's just, it's a golden retriever thing. I think she is just stubborn because she'll, I mean, we did um, a hike around Mount Hood this past summer and she was doing 17, 18 mile days in the heat with her own little pack wow. on. Yeah. They can do it if they want. Yeah. And she's like, mm, I think I'm, I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Did you have her uh, like when you lived in your house or yeah, how she, long have you had her? Is she just a van? van overlanding pup yeah so mostly just a road pup i got her she was about yeah. five months old and i was let's say two-thirds of the way through my build and i'd been okay. thinking about getting a dog for a long time but it was just never the right time and it requires such a, a certain temperament i think to really enjoy and be successful on the road that i was nervous about getting maybe an older dog that was really set in their ways and that this would be a lot for and then also nervous about getting like a puppy puppy or a dog mm -hmm. that wasn't you know didn't have the right energy or temperament for the road so i looked around for a bit and was actually staying in santa cruz one night went out and got a beer with a friend and just had parked on the street and scrolling through my phone uh looking at craigslist actually because folks had been our dogs had been popping up on a lot of the adoption sites but at least in that area it had been really difficult to find again kind of that sweet spot dog that also had a temperament that I thought would do well on the road mm -hmm. and I saw somebody rehoming there they'd had her for I guess two and a half months at that point rehoming their young golden retriever and I thought man mm. what a dream dog I've always wanted yeah. a golden retriever Fine I'll print does not like email. Overland Expo. <laughs> yeah, I'll just shoot him a quick email. I forgot about it even and woke up the next morning to go watch Sunrise and they had responded and said, can you come see her today? Mm. And I was like, oh, shoot. Wow. Okay. Am I going to go take a look at a dog? You know, because this is the first time I really went seriously considering it. And yeah, short story. Two hours later, I was there meeting her in a park on a rainy day and Unfortunately, she was really sick when I got her, so it was a really long uh, path to health and recovery. But, I mean, I have photos from just the moment I set her in the van. She curled up and just fell asleep on the front, you know, passenger seat. And the rest is history. She absolutely yeah. loves the road. Aww. I mean, at five months, they're already fairly decent-sized, right? It's not like a she you was, didn't get her as a tiny was, puppy. Yeah, she was pretty underweight when I got her, so she actually oh, she kind was. of was like a tiny puppy. Yeah, she really? was about 17 pounds, <laughs> um, oh, wow. which for a that's golden like our, is... Like, that's like a fat cat. <laughs> <laughs> she was pretty <laughs> tiny, um, so she's done a lot of her growing on the road and a lot of her coming back to, to health and life, too. So it's been really cool to see her grow and flourish, not only physically, but mentally and with her confidence, too, out here. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I imagine when you were living with five people in San Mateo, like having a big dog wasn't really an option. Definitely not. And I think too, I was just so focused, you know, whenever I wasn't at my desk working, it was how fast can I pack the car to get to Tahoe or how fast can I yeah, drive right. up to get out of town and go for a hike. And yeah. so I think at that point in my life, having a dog too, it wouldn't have been fair. It would have been a hindrance yeah. in my eyes of like, oh shoot, like I gotta, you know, deal with the dog. But having traveled a bit on the road before my van was done solo, I feel like having a dog has been a really wonderful thing for me on the road, not only a companion for travel, but also just getting to experience the road in a different way, kind of through a dog's mm -hmm. eyes has been so special. Uh, when you did the Colorado trail, did she, I mean, she didn't go with you, did she? She did not. She was too young then. She was only, I guess, yeah, she wasn't even a full year old. She was just about to turn a year. And okay. so I actually had someone in Durango near my brother sit her. And that was the mm -hmm. hardest part of the trail was to not have her for those 25 yeah. or 26 days. And I vowed, you know, we're not doing that again unless she's like with my parents or somebody uh, that, you know, I can yeah. be checking in with all the time much easier getting photos from or having them, you know, come meet me somewhere to, to see her. So, yeah, that was really tough. And uh, I'm excited to say, though, now that she's going to be three this year. Either this summer or next, I'm going to try to attempt the Colorado Trail again with her because it is a dog-friendly oh, wow. trail. And I think okay. she'll finally have the stamina and hopefully better legs than an Overland Expo to yeah. uh, do the hike. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Maybe not so stubborn. Yeah. I mean, she'll have to carry yeah, her well, own gear too, probably, right? Somewhat. So it's I did uh, the Timberline Trail and it circumnavigates the uh, base of Mount Hood. Sorry about that. Uh, mm -hmm. In Oregon. And so we did that and it was about a 50 mile trip over three days. She did great. Didn't carry her own gear, though, because it was just going to be warm. And a lot of the river crossings, mm. too, I had to carry her and I just ended up packing all of hers as well because I figured it'd be easier to have it on my back than to carry a dog who also has their own gear when I needed mm -hmm. to. So I think it'll depend on temperature. I might have yeah. a bag that she carries part of the time through some of the higher elevations where it'll be cooler. But leaving Denver, especially now having done the trail, it's just way too hot and exposed there. Yeah. And with her long hair, it's everything to manage her temperature as best I can. And some parts of that trail is sort of just on the side of the highway, isn't it? Not much, actually. There's a, a yeah. bit of road walking, but I'd say under 20 miles out of the whole 500. It's pretty small. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, because our friends did, they did Winter Park to Durango. Cool. Right, I think... That's a, a section of the whole trail. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that beautiful. was that was sort of in between your your campers. Um, have you found other yeah. things living this life? Obviously, having a pet is you know brings some limitations on with the heat and mm -hmm. places that you might not be able to go, like national parks. Are there yeah. other things that you feel that challenges you living this lifestyle? Mm -hmm. That's maybe that's maybe unique yeah. to you that you know other people may not think about when they when they consider living on the road. Totally. Yeah, I think the biggest in terms of having the dog, we'll go there, I guess first is she is a very very friendly happy dog. Um, unfortunately while on the road camping out in BLM and I don't say this to scare anyone, but it's just something that I hadn't really I guess considered as much. Um, she has this really long 30 foot tether that if I'm not, you know, watching her, I have her on, especially when she was younger. Cause she's just so explorative, right? She's curious about everything and for her safety and also wildlife safety. I just mm -hmm. have always had her on her lead. And that really started to shift this past year because unfortunately she was attacked multiple times by different dogs out on BLM mm. while she was tethered to the rig. And wow. that has brought about some fear-based reactivity from her now where if she sees yeah. another dog and she's on her leash she feels i think trapped and stuck and so we've really been having to work through a lot of that on the road which i mean having a golden retriever everyone thinks oh she has to be the most friendly and she is um but the mm -hmm. fear and the reactivity that's come from some of these experiences for her have been difficult to navigate and i'd say that really affects us now in terms of where we'll stay 
being in campgrounds mm -hmm. is pretty much off limits now because there's always going to be dogs running around and that's just really scary for her to again yeah. feel stuck in um, being down in Baja has been quite the experience as long as everyone's off leash she's fine but if she's on lead and it's you know it's not been the Baja dogs it's been the other American and Canadians actually yeah. with their dogs off leash that'll rush her and we've had you know a couple of scuffles there so I think it's really changed how we camp in terms of the amount of seclusion or isolation that I pursue. It's nice to have a quiet site, but it's also really trying to make sure that she feels safe and secure on the road. And so we'll tend to stay in areas that are much less populated or, you know, on the outskirts of the busier areas just to make sure that we're all having a good time. You know, I, I would hate to have her out here and for her to be constantly stressed. So it's a priority that would not be even a thought in my mind probably if it was just me. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like having a dog as a solo female traveler or something? I mean, it's obviously part of it is a bit of a security thing too, right? For any kind of traveler or solo alone, like dogs can hear things quicker than we can, especially at night if something's happening. Like how much of that do you think is like plays a factor in your travel like do you do you feel safer having her around or would you not travel if you didn't have a dog with you yeah i don't think that i wouldn't travel if i didn't have a dog with me but i definitely do appreciate her presence from a safety aspect and it's not that mm -hmm. i feel unsafe i think if i could tell any anything to a uh, another solo female or solo person out here i would say that a lot of the safety concerns that i had initially pretty pretty quickly melted away i think for the most yeah. part i mean people are good and they're not out here looking to harm you and so as long as you're staying places that aren't known to be you know dangerous inherently i think i at least feel comfortable there i will say though having her kind of as an extra security blanket is really nice and she, like you said, she'll hear things from a mile away. She actually started mm. barking. because She heard a van coming. It turned out to be my friend when we were up in Bahia de Los Angeles. I think my friend was probably still over a mile and a half out. And she started barking. Wow. Like, what the heck is going on? You know, wow. but we hadn't yeah. seen anyone for days. And I think she was just like, the, their hey, van like, has like a special transmission click that, uh, <laughs> That needs I, to be looked at. I have <laughs> no idea. But yeah, just a, just a pro master coming down the road and it took at least another five or six minutes for them to get there. But it's yeah. that, you know, sort of thing. She's very protective. She sees us as mm. her home and we're, you know, family. And so she mm -hmm. will jump in between me and a stranger if she doesn't know them. She'll jump in between me and a dog if they're approaching. And, you mm -hmm. know, I just, I guess, really appreciate that peace of mind that comes with having her as well in terms of, you know, just safety as a solo person, but also companionship. It's so nice to have someone to talk to. So I don't just look like a crazy person uh, talking to myself. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so sometimes the camera is pointed at the dog as you're making a, a little soliloquy on camera. Yeah. Yeah. It's always fun what kind to of... write your, your camera up and then someone sees you and you're just like, hi, like, yeah. please ignore me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. You just have to, you know, I mean, by now you realize that like, it's okay if they think I'm crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. And you know what? They can, I've been, you know, kind of uh, fingers pointed or like, haha, like point, pointed yeah. fun at before, like, oh, with her big camera, especially now with my big old microphone on it. Um, but I just have to remind myself, I'm like, you know what? They just wish that they could make money out here with their camera. So I'm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I tell myself that of like, you wanted this, like, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. What kind of uh, what kind of camera do you use? You are on a A6000, but I assume you've upgraded since? I have, yeah. It actually took me quite a while. I really wanted to feel like not only was I committed to doing this, but I think the best camera, it's not a hot take. A lot of people say this, but it really is the one that you have. And so for a long time when I was doing international travels, I had a GoPro. And so stepping mm -hmm. up to the A6000 from a GoPro was like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah. And I can switch the lenses, wild. And so I stayed on the 6000 for a long time uh, and then upgraded from the kit lens after about a year and a half. I felt like, okay, I'm really liking this and, you know, let's get that 18 to 105. So not a full frame, but just let's just have some more more range. 
And then mm-hmm. once I felt like I had not outgrown that necessarily, because I think you can stay on that system forever, and it's not necessarily about the shots, but about the story. I was, mm-hmm. but it's got its limitations. Yeah, and I was looking to get into you know more of the color profiles and really explore mm-hmm. more of what Sony had to offer. So I, st- I stuck with Sony, and now I'm on the A7 IV, which I have absolutely loved. And purchasing this mm-hmm. camera, I'm like, unless I drop it off a cliff. I don't think there's a reason that I will have to ever, you know, upgrade. This camera is much more than I needed, um, but I just saw it as kind of a next step and not wanting to half step and then need to purchase, you know, another camera in the future. So, yeah, but I absolutely love it now. We're shooting on an A7 IV right now. I don't know if you can tell, but <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> what, what lenses are you using? Right now I'm shooting uh, mainly just two down here. Well, three, I guess. I have a 35 prime. Um, just a Zeiss lens. Oh yeah, lens, people love that 35 point. prime. It's awesome. It's all I brought with me on the Colorado Trail, and mm. I to this day, if I only brought one lens, it would probably be that one, just in terms of wow. its size. And yeah. I think the quality for the price, also being someone more on a budget, is exceptional. Mm-hmm. Um, is it a 1.8? It's a 2.8 is what I have. 2.8, I didn't, I didn't okay. Get the 1.8. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, for what I do and Sony's ability, uh, the sensor and low light, I think it's still more yeah. than most yeah. most other lenses have afforded me. Uh, and then I also have two F4s. I have the, I guess I just purchased the 24 to 105, which I've really been enjoying. Mm. Uh, it's yeah. just a really nice mid-range again not too yeah. heavy i can hold it in my arm for minutes at a time without feeling like it's going to fall off <laughs> um, but still affords me that range and as someone who is shooting fully by herself it's nice to be able to get a variety of shots and you know different yeah. depths with one lens and not constantly i feel like that 24 to 105 if you're only going to get if you're only going to have one lens that's the one to get even yeah. though it's an f4 but you still get plenty of shallow depth of feel at 105 yeah yeah i've really been loving it and i've paired that actually for baja i bought what i consider my dream lens i got the 100 to 400 uh and that's i think the 4 to 5.6 which down here for wildlife has been so so fun to play with so very much still we have that lens too in fact (laughs) that's the lens that basically lives on her camera I just, I'm a sucker for birds, so in Baja, I fell in love with that lens. Like, I was so scared to use it. I'm like, this thing is so huge, and, like, it just was overwhelming. Yeah. Um, but, it, yeah, in Baja, it's like, I, I have to shoot, and I just, like, it pushed yeah. me to make my everyday totally. lens. <laughs> so you're talking headshots. Is that with the 35, usually? So lately, it's been mostly the 24 to 105, actually. The 24. I find, especially just with my arm length, if I'm on yeah, the 35. Yeah, it's not far enough for a 35. It's, yeah, I'm just close enough to get, like, the top to bottom, which is not okay. usually the ideal <laughs> shot. <laughs> no. But it's very intimate. Um, it's, People love you know, being never, me, you know, yeah. getting up, up and close. <laughs> seeing all your, the all your pores. Trail, it's great. Yeah, you know, it's for the Colorado Trail, that was all I had, so I worked with it, and it was great. Um, um, just a different feel for sure. But I find that the 24 yeah. mil is perfect to not distort good. your face so much, but still, you know, have more in your frame of view as opposed to just, just this little bit. <laughs> Are your shot, a lot of your shots on tripods? You know, I'd say I actually do mostly handheld. Some things are on tripods, especially now with the 1 to 400, just because being stable with the wind and the sand mm-hmm. and all of that is beyond yeah, my uh, skill level. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of my yeah. longer range shots are all on the tripod. Or if I'm setting up camp and I want to just have more of an establishing shot, that'll be on a tripod since I am just solo. But everything mm-hmm. else is much more run and gun, and I've just tried my best to, to be as stable as I can. And I think also Sony's um, optical steadying uh, abilities are really mm-hmm. exceptional. And combine yeah. that with a bit of you know Final Cut Pro post-editing, it's, it's worked yeah. out okay for me. I think it's 7.4 is a great platform, but you know, just don't watch any new reviews of new cameras <laughs> that get released. <laughs> Because every time something new comes out and you're like, I wish I I had that, (laughs) that sure looks nice. (laughs) Yeah, well, and I definitely, I mean, I've just kind of not built out. There's so much you could purchase for when you get into cameras. It's like a never ending uh, hobby. Oh, yeah. It's a black hole. Yeah, I feel like. 
as soon as I got fully into Sony and I was committed a couple years in, I have my favorite lenses now, I know when to use which tools, mm -hmm. everyone switched to Fuji. And I was like, I mean, oh, people have been geez, switching to Fuji for nice. a long time now, yeah. but I feel like yeah. Fuji, the thing about Fuji is that they finally got to the point where, where their IBIS is good and then their autofocus is good. For sure. Well, and I think I've been able to supplement that. You know, it's, I'm not seriously considering switching, but I, even a day or two ago, I think I just saw uh, Fuji release their new X100 VI or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and everyone's X100 now fake. selling their... I've saw some, seen so many bodies for sale this morning on uh, stories and whatnot because everyone's pre-ordering yeah. wow. their new, their new yeah. body. But I think you have to just... Well, the X100 series is uh, it's a fixed, fixed lens. Like, yeah. you know, you can't... That's all you got. I mean, which yeah. is kind of like you shooting with your 35, right? Like, you just work yeah. with it. But, you know, for a sure. lot of those people paid a bundle of money for their for their X100Vs. Well, and I think for a while there was a shortage, right? You couldn't get one yeah. if, if you wanted they to purchase. They stopped so letting were people charging, order. You know, $2,000 yeah. for a body that originally maybe cost them twelve or 1300 which is wild. Right. Absolutely yeah. wild. But, yeah, I think, too, for me, I was not – and I'm not classically trained in photo or video. Um, I grew up with a mom who liked to take photos, but it was very much, mm -hmm. you know, families on vacation, nothing uh, professional okay. necessarily. And so I'm still very new to this world and learning. And I find that what's been the most exciting to me is learning about all of it and also getting creative. And so using something like a, a Prime, my 35, or I recently just got a, a Canon AE-1, and so I'm excited to develop oh, all cool. of that when I get That's... back to the States. That is what yeah. I learned photography on, AE1. Yeah. And, like, imposing these limitations on yourself, I feel, forces you to think outside the box and get creative. It's nice mm -hmm. to have versatility. It's nice to be able to, you know, zoom in as close as you want or, you know, do uh, make any of the adjustments that you want in post. But just working with what you have and having those limitations, I think, for myself at least, has really forced me to think mm -hmm. more about what I want to have in frame and how I want to set up a shot. And I think ultimately is going to push me to be a better videographer, if you will, or that's the hope at yeah. least. So yeah, sure. it's been fun to have a limited arsenal. And, um, with that AE one and those FD lenses, get an adapter for your, for your a seven four. And that is a lot of fun. We've got a couple of, uh, Canon FD vintage lenses that, yeah. We don't use it a lot for things that actually go online, but it's super fun to play with. And in fact, like getting, getting in, getting into the f photography fundamentals, because you're forced to use, you know, manual mode, and you're forced to dial everything in exactly the way that it needs to be. So yeah, that's that's really fun. You sh you'll have a lot of fun, and that's also another way to play with your camera without spending a bunch of money on film. <laughs> That would be lovely. Yeah, because I mean, I, I knew it was going to be another expensive hobby. I have too many of those by now. But well, if you incorporate it into your videos, then it's kind of a tax write-off, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and I'm hoping to, I, I make videos every week, which is both awesome and stressful, right? I know you all yeah. release videos often as well. I think it's great. Not every forces... week. We can't play that algorithm game. That's too much. <laughs> That's what we can't yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it forces me to just continue creating and not, yeah. you know, have big lulls because I feel like for myself, it's been good incentive to create every day or almost every day. Mm -hmm. At the same time, though, thinking especially now about, you know, shooting more film and, oh, man, it'd be so cool to do, I mean, series have been done about Baja backwards and forwards, but to do a longer summer series or something and be able to incorporate the film photos that I'm taking in the actual video that I'm going to produce. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely given me a lot of ideas for what I want to do in the future and where I want to take things from here, as opposed to, like you said, just kind of creating on that cyclical al algorithm cycle um, or path. It serves a purpose. And if it helps you grow, that's great. But I think I'm starting to um, lose the desire to keep feeding into it as much as I have yeah. and maybe create more meaningful long form pieces, hopefully in the near future. Yeah, that's actually something that we heard a lot of people talk about. Like, do you feel like, as far as being a, a creator, do you feel like YouTube continues to be? I mean, obviously, for from a from a revenue generation purposes, it's got this built-in, you know, revenue. But um, you know, 
I think I've heard you talk about it in some of your videos, which is like diversifying that income just, just in case that we're able to end or dry up for some reason. Yes, I think diversification of income is so important, especially uh, in this space, but also just working for yourself, right? Is having those mm -hmm. multiple multiple options when it comes to making money and as someone who is on my own you know my job my income is all that supports me and so it's even more important i think and it's really influenced how i create at least in terms of the timeline over the past few years because in transitioning from that you know full-time nine to five where i got a paycheck bi-weekly to i make money when i create things or when i work with mm -hmm. a brand has been a big shift and it's not that I dislike creating weekly, but there have definitely been times where, oh man, if I could have just an extra day to work on this, I could, you know, really have this match my vision or I could make this work better, in my opinion, for uh, what I'm trying to create. But it's due to a brand or, you know, if I don't publish on this day, is my algorithm, is the algorithm not going to, you know, push my content? And so I think yeah. there's been some frustration on my side from that, just because having that extra time and ability for such creative pursuit, I think is what makes it creative work. Um, but also I have to support myself. So this mm -hmm. year I'm really focusing on increasing my revenue streams. I am actually really excited to be working with two different friends. Um, this is kind of first, first news, but I have a friend who All right, a we're getting shop. a little, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have a friend who owns a coffee shop down in San Diego and she selects and picks all of the beans from small woman owned sustainable farms across South America and Africa Whoa. as well. Now she just expanded there. And I have another friend who is a very well-known designer in the overland slash Instagram world. You might know who I'm referring to. And she does really, really exceptional work um, for branding and design. And so she's going to be designing the packaging and my friend is going to be procuring the beans and we're actually working together to launch a physical product. And I'm going to be um, having some uh, roasts of coffee come out later this year, which I'm really excited wow. about. So That's exciting. Trying to diversify, yeah. trying to get into a bit of a new space. I love coffee. Yeah, because I see you working exciting. coffee into your videos <laughs> fairly <laughs> frequently <laughs> lately. It is my ritual. Yeah, I really love a good <laughs> cup of coffee. Um, have definitely been excited to find good beans down here as well. But yeah, yeah. so doing things like that, I think is going to help uh, just provide more stability and also allow me to maybe step back from working, you know, with direct ads in my work as much, which yeah. ultimately would be my goal is to maybe have overarching sponsors, but not yeah. so many ads in the video. So yeah, have I guess you, um, so the brands that you've worked with besides people that you already know, have you, have you approached them yourself or have most of them been the one that who have approached you? I'm the wrong person to ask about this, unfortunately, because I do work with an agency. Actually, I have a team that represents myself and they're actually, I think, representing quite a few of the nomad van lifers who create yeah. on a more weekly basis over on YouTube. And so I do have representation in that sense. And a lot of the work is them reaching out to brands, but okay. also once I think brands work with and I'd say Blue Eddy is my biggest sponsor. I've been working with them now for about a year and a half, and I'm working with mm -hmm. them through the end of this year as well, which I'm very excited mm -hmm. about because I use their product. It's what powers my Starlink around the clock. Um, but I'll be working with them again this year. And once you have a, a relationship through the agency, I find that it's been much easier if you do good work to have that renewed. And so now, instead of doing these one-off partnerships, I'm working much more long-term, which I think for myself is the first step yeah. in kind of transitioning to having again just more channel sponsors as opposed to each individual video yeah right so so in that sense do you feel like that that aspect of your income is going to help stabilize any sort of ups and downs with what youtube might do in the long run definitely yeah having a stable paycheck or you know being on a longer term contract is really big peace of mind so as much mm -hmm. as sometimes it can be a bummer you feel like maybe you're sacrificing some of that creativity having peace of mind having stable income i think ultimately is going to allow me to create more organically as opposed to feeling like oh, i have to make up a video for this new random product that i've you know only tried a couple times um, now i feel like i have more stability i have more freedom to be creative and mm -hmm. only work with products and companies that i actually use and really believe in i think it's super important to 
not just try to, you know, throw things at your community, especially if you're trying to create and foster like honesty and trust. Um, I really don't want to just be working with folks to make a buck. I want to be working with them because I believe in their product and think that my community could benefit. Yeah, and and it comes across in the content too. It comes out more organically, right? So it doesn't feel like you're selling something and it doesn't feel like you're trying to get somebody to buy something, which can always be a challenge when you come across somebody who's reaching out directly for a a one-off promotion. It's like, you know, I'm not going to do that just for the money because it's going to look, it's going to be end up being a lose-lose for everybody. So I feel like it's it's great that you you can find brands that, that work with you. And we only work with a couple of brands on a long-term basis like that. And that's the same reason. We only work with them because we actually use their stuff every day. Yeah. So, well, and the cool part great. too has been a lot of the partners that I've had over the last year or so, because it's really up until the last year, I, I wasn't working with brands. I was a really small creator and just my YouTube ad revenue, which you know is tumultuous mm-hmm. and low. Uh, that was yeah. my only income from YouTube. And so uh, I've worked with companies who I'd say probably 90 to 95% of the brands, I can think of maybe one right now that I wasn't actually already using before the partnership, which has been really mm-hmm. cool because these are brands mm-hmm. that reached out and I said heck yes you know I actually yeah. use this electrolyte every day or you're my greens powder anyways like this is so perfect because I'm already using it and I think there's yeah. there's no better way to work with a company than that do you so so you enjoy working through an agency I mean obviously they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you right so you don't have to be the one reaching out to form these long-term relationships and, and is that kind of how you foresee the growth happening within your content creation? I hope they're not watching this. Um, Yes, (laughs) possibly. No, no, it's okay. I I have enjoyed working with my agency and I do, I do enjoy working with them. They've done great work at getting these longer term partners uh, for my channel and for my community. I will say though, it really is tied pretty intimately into working with the algorithm. And so I think, you know, the further I can get away from that, which ultimately would be my goal is to put out content that I feel is finished and good creative work, which doesn't always align with a weekly schedule. I think the more and more difficult it will be to partner traditionally, I guess, through an agency, because that's really what they're looking for is, you know, three Instagram reels a week or two Mm -hmm. YouTube videos every month. And if I can't guarantee that, I think it would be difficult. And so I see some growth happening in terms of maybe stabilizing my income throughout this year, but far out into the future, I am definitely, I mean, even right now, reaching out to brands and trying to just build a relationship with them, even if it's not, you know, compensation based, just trying to foster relationships, introduce myself. It's also part of the reason why going to the expos has been a priority of mine is to go up and shake someone's hand in person and become more involved in the community so that way in the future when I am ready to kind of take the jump and go towards more organic based creation I'm not doing that in free fall hopefully but I have existing relationships and partners that I might be able to work with again on that more long-term sponsorship basis for sure (laughs) for sure I mean you know it's it's one of these like the snake eating its tail kind of thing, right? When you, when people ask you about how do you support your travels, then it's like your travel supports your travels. But at some point, how do you make it so that it still feels organic and you still are able to do what you want to do rather than where the traveling and the, and the income dict- dictates you to do, you know? For so sure. like, I guess along those lines, like what are your, what are your sort of near to medium turns as far as travel plans? I mean, obviously... Baja for the next few more weeks. Mm-hmm. Like where yeah, where, well, where have you it. seen in the U.S. and have you are you staying within North America for the time being? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Baja for a few weeks, and then throughout this coming year, I have some plans of exploring places that I have not seen yet. Um, it's kind of based around some tentative plans. I've already talked a bit about the camper being a limiting factor, so that, that is something that I'm potentially working on this year that might skew where I go, but Mm -hmm. I would say through 2024, I will likely be staying in the American West, uh, partially because Three expos, right? So summer going around. Yeah. I have my brother, you know, he's getting married this year. I have some family things going on that I want to be more present for. So that will likely take Mm -hmm. me through the end of this year, depending on how all of that goes. 
and fingers crossed, I'm really hoping to make it up to Alaska next summer, so 2025, and spend part of spring and early summer traveling through BC and the Yukon, at least, which I'm mm -hmm. really excited for because I've never done that, you know, on road. I've only ever flown into cities up there. And then depending on how everything goes, either 2025 or 2026, I'm really considering starting the Pan American Highway. So that's oh, a really cool. big, <laughs> big yeah. decision to make and a long term plan that I'm very excited for. But I just want to make sure that the timing is right. And so yeah. it'll depend on a, a couple of things when I really. I mean, if you go to up that. to Alaska summer 25, mm -hmm. then you naturally just keep <laughs> going south, right? Keep going south until there's no more <laughs> south to go. Yep, I know. And that's what I told myself is if I'm already driving up there, like I might as well yeah, start. Yeah, if you're that, already going right? to do it. Right. Yeah. We should yeah. just down back. the street. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pan American <laughs> Highway, they say just one road, you know, you just keep going. Yeah, yeah no, we, we, we should be back summer of 25. And last time, there, our first time going to Alaska is with, with a trailer. And then we always talked about going back to Alaska without a trailer. Yeah. So it'd be pretty hard to resist if we're yeah. back and you know our 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 big life changes that in 20 September or August of 25 our oldest will be headed to college if she doesn't take a gap year. So we'll see. Yeah. Wow. You know, so a lot of things can change on our end, but I would I would go I would do Alaska for sure again and then you should definitely do it. And obviously winter winter 25, I'm guessing back down to Baja, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems to be a pretty natural, like you said, just get on the road and don't get off. So that that's yeah. where that would leave me, I think. And yeah, I actually had the privilege of going to Argentina and Chile in the Patagonian region this past year and absolutely fell in love with the landscape. Um, but I did just fly mm -hmm. down and bus everywhere. And so I think just the, the cool. thought of being able to have my home and my dog down there with me um, along, you know, all yeah. of South America is just so exciting and i want to make sure it's the right time but i also feel you know a year year and a half from now i feel like probably be ready and i i have definitely not seen everything that i want to see stateside there's so much to do and so much to explore yeah, yeah. but i have kind of been feeling the itch of like okay like what's next you know i've been on the road yeah. now for over two and a half years and I have been thinking you know what what inspires me what excites me and canada mm -hmm. and alaska first and foremost and then from there yeah exploring more internationally as well mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah. um okay so <laughs> it's a time for a rapid fire i Dan. think we have we have a bit of a rapid fire it's <laughs> Let me not just check the front door really quick it's not like it's not like a <laughs> super it doesn't have to be super fast paced rapid fire okay? but these are cool. just kind of questions that you know we know that if you if you've done a couple of podcasts, you get asked the same questions a lot. So we try to like switch things up a little bit, so it's not the same type of rapid fire questions that you might get. But on the other hand, it's not like a gotcha kind of thing. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Perfect. So go. we'll go with uh, we'll go with first one. Having been in a few different rigs, mm -hmm. I know that obviously your latest is the one that you're currently in. But if you could choose any camper any rig setup money not being a factor but um but you got to consider what happens after you get it so it's not like you have unlimited cash you have you have unlimited cash for this <laughs> camper and after that camper becomes yours you're on your current income again yeah. what would that setup be yeah yeah, I think that question is great. The The stipulation is great, right? Because you could say, oh, I want right. a dreamy VW, but it's going to break down constantly. And I no, you can't, that right, you can't, right? You can't afford the maintenance because the, the, yeah. the money only comes yeah. to, in the purchase. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I think honestly it would be pretty similar to this. I love the reliability of the Toyota. So money in that sense in the future being a factor, I think having some reliable is so important. Yeah. I also just love the truck camper platform. And so pretty similar to this, but I think in terms of a dream um, brand non-specific I think having something that does potentially pop up but lowers down and is mm -hmm. more capable off-road 
would suit my lifestyle a little bit better. And then more yeah. gear storage, I think, is the other part that I've really been looking for. The whole mm. back of my truck, it's a double cab. It's built out with a platform and boxes, and my pack raft lives in bed with me, actually, which is pretty funny. But um, having something with more outdoor gear storage would be great. So maybe those uh, you know, flatbeds with the outdoor storage on the sides yeah. would be huge yeah. for me in the future. And I could see myself maybe trending more in that direction, but probably sticking with a truck camper. So I'm thinking a tundra with the with a hawk flatbed. <laughs> but I think you need to give Dan Dan Welty a phone call from you. I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean those are those are the dream, right? It's a pretty pretty BA, I don't know if you can swear, pretty pretty incredible uh platform. So yeah, maybe one day. I definitely. think that'd be pretty cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. I <laughs> definitely concur. Um okay, so you know, we're probably a few years from when you may feel like you want to settle somewhere. But when that time comes, and we know that there is no perfect place. No. I mean, having seen places and been to places, we know that there's pluses and minuses of every place. So I'm not going to ask you what is your favorite, but I will make you pick three plots of land anywhere in the world. And what will you build on these three plots of land? Oh man, three plots. This is fun. Thank you for giving me yeah. choices. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, well, the stipulation is that you know, once you've once you've built it, when you're not there, we want to be able to go. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> um, I think the one that's been on my mind, and it seems like it's kind of a trend these days, uh, but it makes sense why is high desert in Colorado. If I'm going to build something, especially okay. on my own because I think the permitting and land regulations there are flexible enough to where you can get really creative and more DIY it, and that's very appealing to yeah. me. Um, now that I have a little bit of experience. Do you think on the Western Slope? I would think, yeah, kind of that central strip or valley of Colorado. I'm thinking, you know, Salida, Del Norte, oh, outside yeah. of Pacuta, okay. you know, the Southwestern yeah. Vista, maybe. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely gets cold, but it's still fair weather enough and not so much snow that it's unmanageable mm -hmm. if you wanted to be there in the winter. And I mean, summer in Colorado is just spectacular. So right. I think that that's why really you get cool. three. You don't have to be there all the time. Yeah, yeah. No, this is good. This is good. <laughs> um, okay. I think for winter, you know, and I'm I'm a little biased. I grew up there and I've traveled a lot of places around the world, but Santa Cruz will always be home to me. And I think if yeah. I could afford something in Santa Cruz, <laughs> having kind of yeah. that perfect combination of some mountains and the redwoods and also being that close to the ocean in a more temperate environment. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the dream. Is so you would go back. You would go back to there. Santa Cruz if you, if you could. At least for part of the year, right? Because we get three. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you get three. That's true. Yeah, and yeah. you have to keep them. You can't sell them for cash after yeah. it's done. No. Okay. No, I would stay there. I, I love Santa Cruz through and through. Okay. So um, so winter in Santa Cruz, summer yeah. in Salida. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there's a lot of really... In the shoulder really season. Where do you go in the shoulder you know? season? I'm going to go with Eastern Sierra, probably. Oh, Eastern yeah, Sierra. yeah. That's a yeah. good choice. Yeah. And yeah. a little Where? Biased. Tell me a city. Which house yeah, in well, Bodie State Park yeah. are you going to buy? Yeah. <laughs> oh, the one gosh. with, with all, the, all, the, all the glass in the window? <laughs> that could be pretty epic. But, you know, I actually, when I was little, under three years old, my parents lived in Mammoth Lakes. And so I think a part of me mm. has always felt drawn back there into the Eastern Sierra. Yeah. Having gone back and explored now, I think Mammoth itself has grown beyond its britches, especially in terms of just, you know, 90% of the residents feeling like they're just there seasonally. So I don't right, know that I'd want to be right. in town specifically, but I think maybe slightly lower down, like outside of Bishop, still, you know, mm -hmm. at the base of the Sierra, again, a little bit more fair weather, mm -hmm. maybe not getting 10 to 15 feet of snow at once, but a couple feet at a time would be great. Bishop is high um, up on our list. Bishop yeah. Bishop has such a great unexpected food scene. Yeah. I mean the Bishop's awesome. <laughs> Bishop's awesome. I mean, you know, for some reason like Bishop's not high enough elevation anymore with the weather heating up, I guess, cuz it can get really yeah. hot there. But, yeah. you know, shoulder season? Yeah. Yeah. Great. I've heard good things about Tom's place too. We'll keep this between us, but yeah, in terms yeah. of you know being again that elevation sweet spot where you're not getting quite yeah. as much yeah. snow, but it's also not getting quite as hot. Um, a little more. I mean, Tom's place. You're practically practically in Mammoth by at, at that point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You are. That's but cool. Yeah, that whole area. I like it. Awesome. Okay, so so the second part of that is what 
what would you build? What kind of structure would you build on these three plots? Man, <laughs> I go back and forth. I thought about this a lot. That's why it's a hard question. Um, I <laughs> we we've all yeah. thought about it. I feel like anybody who travels like have nor like constant daydreams about this kind of scenario, which is why sure. I love to hear what everybody's answer is. Yeah. You know, lately, I will say I've made the jump from and I think shipping container homes are very cool. And I think in terms of mm -hmm. cost, they're also a pretty effective way to stretch your dollar. So that part is attractive to me. And I think there's creative ways to stack them and turn them and make these really cool structures. Um, but I've actually really been getting more into like the solar passive heating and cooling homes that have this mm -hmm. like, big outdoor greenhouse slash like garage workshop so they'll have a whole wall that's like a plexi or a corrug corrugated plexi with all this natural light and you can grill your food regardless of season and a big workshop and then a home that's made out of more of like a cinder block style or that cement home vibe that's not only structurally pretty sound but also again very um off-grid friendly self-sustaining with uh, the heating and cooling so i think Ideally, nice. if I can one day, I would love to build my own home like that and go in that direction. Okay, so this third question is a little bit different, but um, you know, you can be creative with this if you want. If the three of us were to start a business together, what would it be? Oh man. <laughs> and you can be a silent partner if you want, or if you want us to be silent partners, we can be that too. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, I'm trying to think about your expertise. I mean, travel guys. I mean, assume maybe assume Natural. we know nothing. <laughs> you know nothing. You just have well, to drag us along with your pursuits. Okay. You know what I think you guys would have really great personalities for, and you. I mean, I'd love to know you better in person one day too. But just that easygoing, hip, chill, worldly vibe would be to have some really cool plot of land that maybe is host to a variety of different food truck types. Maybe there's Ooh, some camping yeah. nearby on site, mm. but like a, a worldly mm -hmm. food truck, beer, coffee. Oh, like oh. now you're talking. Yeah. Mm. That could be cool. <laughs> in Bishop. I think yeah. this, this will be in it would Bishop. Be well. yeah. It would do well. It would kill. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. I mean, I don't want to be there all the time, but you know, <laughs> yeah. we have to hire we'll people. Yeah. Where we can, yeah, hire people to take care yeah. of the rest. Yeah. Okay. I like right. it. I like, I like this. it. Yeah. Okay. So last one. Um, so going back, maybe from the start of your travels and then your sort of endeavor for the last couple of years, who inspired you in your travels originally? And who inspires in your work and who inspires you now in both of those areas? Ooh. Okay. Variety of answers here. I'll go back and to, you know, early days, childhood. I said it actually just the other day, it's fresh in my mind. But my grandpa, my mom's dad, actually is a big inspiration for me. I thought he was the coolest dude and I wish that he was around uh, longer in my life. He passed when I was, mm. I think, 12 or 13. Um, but I mean, signed his own papers to, to join the Marines when he was 16 and then went around and traveled the world. He was a motor cross racer. He was an engraver, a watchmaker, just had so many, he lived so many lives and never felt the need it seemed um at least you know in his storytelling to be tied down to any one thing but just really move through life very fluidly and just very inspired so yeah in hindsight then i don't think i could appreciate it as much unfortunately because i was so young but i think he was just an exceptional human and he's the only person actually in my family too on either side that really ever traveled or explored much mm. outside of california and so i think i definitely wow. got some of that bug from him uh, I think in my work and travels now, I'm inspired by a variety of people. I think there's a couple of really big players in this space specifically that a lot of us look up to, um, some in your circle even. I know uh, you're friends with you know, Bound for Nowhere and Tight Loops and Chase and Amy and Mac and Owen I think are just incredible storytellers and the way that they capture this lifestyle and their adventures is just spectacular. So I, I really look up to both of them. I think outside of maybe the 
travel videography and filmmaking realm though really inspired by some people that i'm grateful to call peers now um, a friend of mine linnea she is linnea and Aquila is her channel on youtube and platforms she was the person who really i looked up to before i ever met her um, when i was back living in my little pandemic apartment thinking oh gosh like she's building a van all on her own maybe i can do that one day too and now i'm grateful to you know i've gotten to go backpacking with her and traveled with her a bit and still to this day i'm just so inspired by her zest for life her desire to be self-sustaining um and just her passion in everything that she does that's awesome that's yeah. amazing Maybe yeah sharing that. yeah i mean we feel like we got to know you pretty well in these last couple of hours but we yeah. for sure would love to maybe next maybe next year when we're back we'll do uh we'll do alaska <laughs> yeah that would be super fun and then i'll get to hear about your lives more as well and meet your meet your kids you all seem like incredible humans and i'm sure they are as well well you just have to know that they're teenagers <laughs> Stop. <laughs> okay. maybe they're just teenagers yeah yeah i'm close yeah enough for to sure for sure maybe still where yeah. i can yeah. pretend to be cool i can pretend to be you know <laughs> hip and with the times they're probably not going to think i'm cool at all and that's fact, true well no we'll, we'll tell them you're we'll tell them you're 19 and you know you, you can just totally Perfect. play along yeah i'll use they my won't dog as a bargaining chip most they'll use your like dog dogs, for sure so yeah <laughs> well thank you for all being right. on Thanks for spending a couple hours with us. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great chatting. Yeah, this was yeah, an have, incredible time. Thank you. Have a fun rest of your time in Baja, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll chat again. That sounds great. Thank you both so much for your time and for this great conversation. I, I hope you do make it to Alaska next year, and uh, stay cool in Costa Rica. <laughs> so there you go. That was our interview with Alexandria from She Roams Wild. And that was actually our first interview with somebody we've never met before. Yeah, not in person. So when we talked to her on camera, it was the first time we've had sort of a face-to-face -face conversation. All the other people that we've interviewed, we've met in real life. Mm -hmm. So we hope to meet Alexandra in real life one day. Maybe next year when we get back to the U.S., she'll yeah. still be on the road and we'll get to talk to her. So if you guys watch her videos on YouTube, she does a really good job of portraying her day-to-day -day nomadic life with her dog. Mm -hmm. So we had a really good time talking to her. And she's now back in the Western US. I think she her last video has her in Nevada. So go give her a follow if you uh, don't follow her already. And check out her videos on YouTube. I think she gives a really good perspective of what it's like for a young solo female to be traveling alone. All right, so that's it. That's our episode 23 of the Freely Roaming Podcast with Dana Marlene. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review. We really appreciate that. And if you're watching this on YouTube, give us a comment down below and a thumbs up. We really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.